Look, uh, good, good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. If uh, councillors could take their chairs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before I um, sort of, uh, well, I'm going to formally open the meeting, but I'd like to um, begin by um, by making a statement. Um, and it's in relation to two people who have um, passed away and I would like to make this um, statement in regard to the two people and then um, I would like us to stand everyone uh, for a minute's silence in their, in their memory. Uh, the first uh, is um, to note the passing of Graham Stanley who was a proud Christchurch native, who was passionate about his city and our region's heritage, physical and natural environment. He was a councillor for the Christchurch City Council's North Ward for three terms between um, 1980 to 1983, 1983 to 1986 and 1986 to 1989. Um, and uh, I knew Graham very well, but I didn't know that he'd been a city councillor. So um, on his passing, it didn't occur to me to, to bring this to the council's attention. But I want us, as a matter of policy, to always refer to those who've gone before us and um, made the city what it is today. Uh, while in council, he became chair of the housing committee, deputy chair of roadworks and traffics, traffic, and was a member of the cultural committee. He was also appointed by the Christchurch City Council to lead the Active Christchurch Walks project in 1998 and received several heritage awards. Um, I went on one of those walks with him and uh, his extraordinary knowledge but love for the city was just so apparent in everything that he did. He passed away at the age of 79 years on April 19. The second is Christine Wilson at the last meeting of the Banks Peninsula Community Board, a moment of silence was held in remembrance of Christine to honour her life and service to our community. She was a member of the Littleton Mount Herbert Community Board and the first chair of the Banks Peninsula Community Board. The Community Board was one of many ways Christine served our community. She was a proud little, little, little Tonian, and many would say she lived to serve her community and family. She started the original Littleton Youth Group and later oversaw the establishment of the Littleton Harbour um, Basin Youth Centre and was a long time manager and facilitator at the Littleton Community House. She was a dearly loved and adored wife, mother, mother-in-law, nana, auntie and great auntie. Christine presented to council on so many occasions in her role as the community board chair and she will be very much missed. So if I could ask you to stand and join me in a moment's silence. Thank you very much. I have an apology um, from Councillor Manji. Would someone like to move that that apology be received? Um, sorry? Oh, sorry. Um, anyone else? So, and Sarah Templeton for early departure. Someone like to move that? Um, Mike, seconded by Jimmy Chen. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Um, declarations of interest, uh, none have been received. Public participation, uh, public forum, deputations by appointment. Um, there are no, none of those today. Uh, presentation of petitions, none of those today um, either. Uh, and uh, we have a, a resolution to include uh, the supplementary report being my monthly report. So would someone like to move that that be <laughs> accepted onto the agenda? Um, Phil Clearwater, seconded by uh, Pauline Cotter. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Now, um, 
just in terms of having uh, acknowledged uh, Christine's passing, could I invite the Banks Peninsula uh, Community Board, uh, Pam Richardson and uh, Joan Blatchfield Ford to come forward first. Thank you. Good morning. Christine's friends, her family, uh, and learn about some of the antics of the, the Bashup boys um, and the other rugby players. It was an amazing occasion, but it just went so smoothly and we had a fine day. Um, so yes, Christine, we remember you. So the next one um, is we move on to Stone Cottage at Alton Bradley Park. Now you all should be going to Alton Bradley Park to have a look at um, Alton Bradley. Um, it, is, it is an old farm. Uh, it's got a lot of history around it. It was uh, a, a Reverend uh, Bradley who originally owned it, uh, and he was a minister and decided that the farming life was a better life to have. So he changed his, his focus, and uh, this is one of the earliest uh, stone cottages, and, and Leanne, you also mentioned this in your report too. Mm. So it's one of Canterbury's oldest buildings and it was badly damaged in the 2011 earthquakes. But the amazing thing about it is the repair of it and the, the number of people mm. around it that did that free mm. um, and had a passion about it um, and did it freely and donated their time and expertise. So we are very thankful that that was... Um, that's been done and a great celebration. So do go and have a look at Alton Bradley, particularly in the spring perhaps when the when the bulbs are out, the rhododendrons are out. It's an amazing park, it has amazing walkways um, and still part of it is, 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 uh, is a farm and there's a lot of old farming exhibitions there as well. If we move on to um, Uruma, now this is a, a challenging uh, process that we've got underway at the moment. There were over 600 submissions to this um, reserve it's one of 15 reserves that we have on Banks Peninsula, and the reserves under the Reserves Act are required to have um, management plans, and this is just the development plan that we've got on the side of it there, of which we've got a few challenges working through. It's right behind the town, it's a mix of walking tracks and cycle tracks, uh, and there's also a passionate planting team around it. It's a great spot close behind the town. But there seems to be some indis indiscriminate track uh, work going on there, so we're just trying to resolve those issues and get down to a safe plan that where people and the cyclists and the walkers can all, can all um, live and work together and get on with the job. The management committee needs a little bit of guidance, um, and we're going through quite a lengthy process to come out with a good decision out the other end. Um, but it, it is going slowly, but I think we will we'll have the result, right results shortly. So then if we could move to the recreation ground. Now this was where there, were, there was two huge marquees for Christine's funeral on the recreation ground. Um, and the, the amazing thing was that they, they fitted on there beautifully. Uh, the other thing was that those rugby lads, this was where they grew up, where they played their rugby. Um, and so this is a very important part of Littleton's recreation opportunities, um, very important part of the community's opportunities and as part of that Naval Point development area where we're looking at a number of things that we hope will happen over the next few years and that area will be improved. Um, and it's, um, it is in a mix of um, industrial activities and things around that area and, it's, and it has got some uh, risks in the area but they're being addressed and hopefully that we will come out also with that with a, a great uh, recreation ground rugby field and it's a field for many things down there and we were looking at the parking and that around that so the next one is 
Akara Wastewater. Well, this is another ongoing saga. We seem to have a number of little sagas that are, are challenging us in the Akara community. We have spoken about it before, and the deep well injection that's being being um, explored, the idea of that. Now, from that, um, we have also got a Devotional's Wastewater Program that that's, um, its consent is being reviewed, or has been reviewed, and we need to have a, a consent in place by, I think, about 2023. So the work that's happening on the Akaral wastewater does also have an impact on the devotionals scheme as well that's being suggested. So if the waste, if the deep well injection in Akaral is, is appropriate, then it will be used and perhaps used in the devotional situation. It'll be very helpful along the way. Uh, won't need so much land and it'll be on council land where, um, where that takes place too. So yes, we have got a number of challenges. And what's our last one, Joan? That's it. That's it. So, yes. Um, but I did actually just want to pull out of there, out of our report, um, the number of the number of there where we, and our dep number of deputations that we're getting to our boards, um, along to our board meetings. They're very well attended. People are very interested in what's going on, and we provide them with every opportunity. So I just want to thank our staff for all their, their time that they give to us as a board. It's extraordinary time that you give to us. Um, very helpful, and we've got some great talents within our team. So thank you. Anyone have any um, questions of Pam? Excellent. Thank you. That's a, an excellent report. Um, Andrew, would you like to move that it be received? I would, yep. And seconded by Sarah. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much, Pam. I didn't see the 10 minutes ticking over. No, well, I didn't put the timer on, but uh, you were you were within the ten minutes. So <laughs> thank you. I'll only put the timer on if I feel that it's necessary. <laughs> Come, uh, the, thanks. Uh, sorry, Coastal Burwood Community Board. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good morning, birthday girl. <laughs> um, <laughs> Councillors, staff. Uh, community and today I had Joe Wells, our governance manager, with me this morning. But no, happy birthday! It's really good. <coughs> um, and as I say, that the year we were born is a great year, but I won't divulge when we were born. Um, mm -hmm. So what we have for you today is um, no part A's. So that's quite straightforward. Uh, then we go straight to some of the things that have been actually sitting on the table of the community for quite some time. So this month we've had a few things come to fruition which is very exciting. And the first one that we have for you today is the fitness trail, which I mentioned last month. Um, so it was officially opened at the beginning of May. We had about 60 people from the Dallington community come and join us to celebrate and the Dallington community Cottage Trust and the community board members and also council staff and other residents associations. It was a fantastic day, it was really cold. Um, as you can see up there, or the previous slide, we had two very special gentlemen cut the ribbon there. They were the gentlemen that um, the project began with, they had the vision and they passed it on to the Dallington Community Centre, but that's Anton Kuruntik and Bill Allett. So it was really exciting to get them to be able to come and take part in that celebration there. So, and the staff did an amazing job putting it all together. And the Dallington Community, oh, you can skip that one. The Dallington <laughs> Community Co Cottage Trust were the ones that had raised the money for the project and the council are going to be actually looking at the maintenance. But I must admit, well, there is a confession that you've got, Glenn, there that you went the week before and got into your Lycra and had the media sort of opportunity, but on the day he came along in his good gear. So, you know, we did have a bit of Lycra there, but not actually on the morning but a really great facility that that community is now able to enjoy. <coughs> so what a week. This was a fantastic opening. I know, um, Leanne, that you've mentioned it in your report as well, but the opening of the Taora Kiwi 2 Recreational Sport, long time coming for this community. Um, it's fantastic. It was an amazing afternoon. The sun came out, which was really nice. We had people from the community, of course, and the children, and invited guests which were all wanting to celebrate the replacement of the old earthquake damaged QE2. It was a fantastic day, and I know it's, it's dangerous to be thanking people, but apart from thanking the council for getting on with that, but there's huge thanks go to Mark, Nigel, John, and their team from staff that really put that together. Mm. Um, it was just an amazing, outstanding. We are always kept in the loop all the way through. Also, the Apollo team, Steve Hastie um, and his team, it was just absolutely outstanding. 
so very, very um, exciting day that was. And it was very appropriate to open the QE2 um, facility on the Queen's birthday mm. weekend. So uh, whether that was planned intentionally, I'm not sure, but it was just a fantastic... Um, I don't think you'll get 14,000 people there next weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as you say, it was um, at its full capacity, yeah. you know, over the weekend. So is great. that is so exciting um, to see. So there was a lot of happy faces and a lot of wet ones, I must say. And... Do we have a picture up there of David? Now there you go. <laughs> now, you have to say the image is going to remain indelibly <laughs> implanted. I'm sorry. Happy, yeah, that's your birthday present, exactly. But I mean, isn't that dedication? No, that wasn't for you? a good thing. <laughs> The um, other person that I saw in his toggies, which was really great to see, was Aaron. Um, not was great to see him in his togs, but I think it was great to see him. <laughs> well, it was but better than that. Aaron was actually there with um, his daughter, so they were having a really nice time there. So good on your councillors. But some of us accidentally, on purpose, forgot our togs. So yeah. you know, it was an amazing day. So thanks very much. Um, so uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> that was great. So well done to everybody. That was very exciting. Now, what else we got here? Just skip through a few of the things. We're going backwards, sorry. Slides in a different order. Oh, now we're going to go to the Memorandum of Understanding with Arunuri Community Trust. I touched on this last time, but we've actually had it now. That was a really special um, evening that we had there with Rob and the team and Rachel. You can see us there, we all signed our thing. It was be beautifully um, decorated, the room. We had a massive big chocolate cake, but it was a signing of that memorandum of understanding which acknowledged um, and all the development, you know, to develop and support this um, group and the positive and special working relationship that we have with them. So that was a real honour to be there and to celebrate that. So good on Actus for um, all the work that they do in the community and now we have a special agreement and understanding between us. So that was a really nice evening as well. Um, on to some of our other significant issues. We had, uh, last time I was here, we talked about some resource consenting issues that we have in um, South Shore, not just in South Shore, but regarding the high flood hazard management area. And um, the board organised a meeting. The residents had come to us and had uh, raised their concerns and they weren't getting too far. So the community board organised a meeting with the resource consent staff. And um, that was a really positive meeting. We had it a few weeks ago. And the staff and the residents found it very beneficial and they appreciated it very much, um, the time that was taken to discuss and understand. Uh, you are not at that red zone bit now. A lot of central board there, yeah, exactly. Um, so that was really great and we had uh, really good feedback since then and some positive actions from that meeting have been done. And also the um, Lumwood Central Heathcote community uh, are hosting This Affects Them as well in their area, so they're actually now going to be hosting a workshop to get some, gain some understanding on how that affects their residents. So that'll be good. Um, the other issue that we do, I, apart from sounding like a crack record, the Estuary Edge uh, um, issues there in South Brighton in that area uh, around the camping ground. We had, we've had two workshops now, which has been really good with staff, Regen and ECAN to discuss the lack of earthquake repairs along that foreshore and the protection works against erosion which are needed. Um, the proposed works in this area, are just we've just put them slightly on hold until we have another meeting tomorrow to debrief about the meetings that we've just had. So really putting a lot of time and effort into this, this is um, an issue for the community as we've mentioned in the long term plan, but just to flag that the Estuary Uhutai Trust um, have also clearly stated in a letter to the Mayor and in their LTP submissions that this stretch of the estuary edge needs erosion protection now, So, um, and that we have had an estimate cost of about 500000 But in the last couple of days, sadly, with the weather that we've just had, um, another tree has virtually fallen over and um, more damage to the edge occurred. So, you know, urgency is really needed for this at the moment. So, the next thing we've got, oh, we'll mention that, talking about the red zone, um, uh, Vicky brought up last time about the that area there, so we have actually as a board asked Lynns to come along and just give us an update on the transitional use that is intended there along the Avon Otakaro corridor. Another exciting thing that opened, also that Leanne's mentioned in her report, was the Red Zone Futures 
um, Avon Otakaro River Corridor options, which is uh, the they have the offices in Central City there, and wanting the feedback from um, our residents. So there's been really good interest in this exhibition, and the board will be visiting at the centre in the coming weeks. It's going to take us quite a few hours to look at all the information because there's some amazing pictures and um, information to go with it. So. Yeah, that's exciting. And finally, um, also the pier has been repaired and it's open and complete, so you can all now go fishing on the end of it and enjoy the pier again. So, yeah, thank you. So, there's uh, one minute remaining of your 10 minutes. <laughs> so. There you go. Good. Thank you very much for your report. That's good. Right. And I presume, David, you'd like to move the receipt of the report and seconded by Glenn Livingston. And include the photos. Including the photos. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the photos. That's why I got him to move it. Um, I'll, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Karen and Potter, Spraden Kashmir Community Board. Kia ora, tātou. Kia ora. Hello. Yeah. Um, we've only got a short report, board report this time. I'd like to draw your attention to the, on the front page where we're looking at the youth awards, there are three young people there who are travelling internationally. One, two of them are going to future problem solving world championships. But the last bloke, the young man, is going to Globe Theatre workshop and performances in London. And I just can't even believe the experiences that young people can have these days. And honestly, their parents must shudder when they think of the next project that those kids are going to involve themselves in. Um, but that's amongst the joys of being on a community board is that you get to see those um, that give those awards and see, uh, sometimes see them come back and report on them. Um, with, I just want to mention briefly the couple of projects in our ward. Coronation Hall, along with Centennial Hall, we had a report on Centennial Hall in our last meeting. These are sort of um, uh, Two, two structures that have been sitting in our ward since the earthquakes, one, and since a motorbike went into it, the other, that remain unused and unloved and uncared for. And we look forward to the LTP coming out to find out if, if we can actually further the um, issues that both of them carry in the centre of our ward. It's depressing seeing both of these structures that were heavily used in their day uh, deteriorating in the middle of the ward. And we would like to, we have hopes that um, the LTP will give us something that could um, either assist in making final, that can assist in making final decisions about both. Um, the Off the Ground Fund is a fund that um, was established, um, actually it was Jenny Huey's idea, staff member Jenny Huey, and it was her idea several years ago immediately after the earthquake that we would have a small fund that would give joy and the intent of the fund is to do nothing else. It is only to uh, one off two organisations for whatever they dream up that might add up to $250 and its only intention really is to give joy. And it is one of those, and it, it has become of increasing importance in a way because the small funds have gone. Uh, small, um, and it's, it's really nice to have something that we can say to the community we can help with that when they've got a bus trip for older people or planning to build a dragon in the kindergartens playground. And, um, and, and it does give us joy too to be able to approve some of the applications that we, most of the applications that we get and the processes of, um, there's no process really. It's just, they ask for something, tell us why, and we say yes. Um, community workshop on the district plan and resource management act processes. This took a long time to organize and I wish we did more of them. 
Uh, some of the processes of council and legislation are arcane and difficult to understand, and being able to talk to the community about how the district plan is organised, what it does, where it happens, who's in charge, and the Resource Management Act processes and the changes that have occurred there and, um, is really interesting, and I think I, I'd, like to, I'd like us to do more of them. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to mention, we put in, yes, we had the mother of all cleanups. One of the founders of um, the River Network is on our board, Helene Mountner, and our board um, involves ourselves, um, all of the members of our board involve ourselves in this. This is a cleanup of the river from the, Heathcote, from the top of the Heathcote through to the estuary, and all of the organisations along the Heathcote, Opawaho Heathcote, are involved and people to come along in huge numbers actually to clean up. I think it was 800, just over, just over. and um, that, that are collected. And we have the cooperation of the council staff, which is great. And um, we met, I met lots of residents on the day who were helping to clean up with their children. Um, and the this was <laughs> this was yesterday. See that cake. Um, Faye Collins on our staff. Oh, wow! She made that cake for us, and we had uh, we had one uh, the opening of the St Martin's Library. Faye Collins made a cake, which was a um, 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 a pile of books. Oh. The, the icing was a pile of books, and Faye and the fence at the nice. top's icing as well, and uh, with the trellis. And so Faye made that, and she does it out of the great goodness of her heart, and. Um, <laughs> And we had, this is a morning tea for the Craycroft Gardeners. And if you look up there, all of those people there are heavily involved elsewhere in the community. Some of them were in the Junior Children's Library. Some of them are involved, uh, John Cousins is there and uh, Rick. Um, They're involved in the Craycroft Residents Association. Carolyn, Caro, second to, third to left, is um, a Craycroft Wilson, was born a Craycroft Wilson, and the non-suburb, and I've got a discussion about that, of Craycroft, which is one of their binds, is that they're not officially a suburb. Um, uh, the Craycroft um, is named after her family, as is the old stone house, and she set the example of going on the zip line at um, a very at a glorious age, and so all of those people there were gardeners in the Craycroft Gardens, and they loved it, and they loved the gardens, and they acted under the control, the stern control, of Norma and Roberts. What's his first name? I've forgotten. Betty, Betty, Betty and Norman Roberts, um, at, under the stern direction of Betty and Norman Roberts, who were the ones who who saved the old stone house. And they've, they've had to give up the garden. It has got too much for them. And they, we came in and had a after, um, after morning tea with them yesterday, which was terrific. I had ordered lamingtons and cream on everything. Um, and the Samoan Language Week, these are four quite frightened people <laughs> singing in the foyer of the City Council here, and they came from Rowley School and Hillmorton School to sing for uh, Samoan Language Week. They did that last Thursday, didn't they? It was last Thursday. And um, the progress report, was, um, the pamphlet, Melanie will be is absolutely thrilled that her idea of a pamphlet coming out in the rates has finally come to fruition, and the age-friendly is age-friendly action plan is being launched at the older adults network meeting next fourth um, of, of July, and there on the back is a note about the Craycroft suburb residents seeking some kind of understanding of what it means to be a suburb and how you get to be a suburb and whether you are a suburb or not. And this has arisen because uh, the name Hoon Hay has been splashed around 10 or 11 k's apart. One goes up um, uh, the valley, uh, um, one goes up the valley near Horswell Quarry Park, but Hoon Hay itself is over, the, over much closer to uh, this side of town in Spraydon. Near Spraydon, sorry. And that was an issue that we'd like to raise with staff, and, which is there. And I think it probably is an issue everywhere. Thank you. Yeah, Tim. 
Uh, <coughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry. No, 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 no. You get so used to cheering that you just keep on. I, I was, I was just, um, I was just um, looking up how you make a locality and create, um, you know, sort of suburb names. Uh, how you make them official and. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, 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 Tim. It's all been done. The only organisation that doesn't recognise it is the council. Yeah, that's right. How do you mean? Well, it's, it's gone. It's been registered or whatever through the government. So the the, the crown has recognised Craycroft as a as a neighbourhood. As a suburb. As a suburb. So the that's council, the New Zealand Geographic Board. Yeah, but yes, they've done all that, but it's the council that doesn't. Yeah. And there are other, there are in, other in areas way, now. Who does feel New the Zealand same? Post recognise it? Yeah. New Zealand Post and Ben yeah. suburbs. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's the anomaly. We are. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so staff, 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 staff responded advising that the areas returned in a rates and valuation search and not what would be considered suburbs. They are administrative boundaries and do not align to other agencies' definition of suburbs. So, so all you're all you're asking is that our rates and valuation search identifies it as a suburb. Not as a suburb, just as an area that they can rate. <laughs> <laughs> We can discuss yeah. Okay. We can. No, no, we'll, we'll take we'll take it up. I mean, it's um, it's Thank been you. brought to our attention officially. Thank you. <laughs> right. So, um, Tim, would you like to move the receipt of the report and seconded by Phil? I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Um, uh, Papanui Innes Community Board. Ali Jones. Christine Main. Thank you. Morena. Morena. Right, well, as you'll see from our uh, happy birthday, she they already had too many happy birthdays. Is that your birthday? <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> uh, anyway, um, so you'll see from our uh, PowerPoint that today the presentation is brought to you by MUD. Um, there's quite a bit going on in the ward, and of course, with the weather that we've had. There's quite a lot of mud in our photographs. The really good news, obviously, for our ward is that apart from some surface flooding, with all the rain that we've had, there haven't been problems. And I think that that's all credit to the work that has gone in and the effort that's gone in over the last two or three years. So this is the St Albans Park and Pavilion. There's the mud, a lot of rain. That's a lovely looking cricket pitch in the middle. That is all on track. And in fact, I've had some really positive feedback from residents who have just got in touch and said uh, it's really moving along at a pace, which is wonderful to see. Uh, and I think all credit again to staff for keeping residents in the loop as to what's happening. And that's been helpful as well. Uh, no Part A recommendations, actually, just um, go back to that. Um, uh, two main issues in the ward at the moment, um, and we'll just let the pictures go through. Well, actually, that's our first main issue in the ward, actually. Uh, the Northern Corridor uh, is uh, powering along. Um, I'll let the pictures just roll through. They're on a timer. Uh, and we are, or we've just completed consultation, which is called the Downstream Effects of the CNC, the um, Northern Corridor Project. And we uh, delivered, or staff delivered, 12,000 documents to residents. 400 submissions were received, 180 of those were received after the first two of four sessions, four or five sessions, consultation sessions. The board will have a workshop uh, giving us feedback on what, um, not detailed, not drilling down, but an overview of the consultation on the 20th of June, and I imagine we'll be able to make some public comment after that, um, but not um, before the 20th. I think what's really important to note here, especially in this public forum, is that there has been some reportage around, um, and we'll always get this, I, I guess, with um, consultations, is that this is a foregone conclusion, it's a fait accompli, 
Council's made its mind up, etc., etc. And I said in the last presentation from the board um, to the council that the consultation documents uh, are fantastic as far as the information they contain and how clear they are. So it's really disappointing to hear that actually from residents. And attending one of the consultations, I had someone say exactly the same thing to me. And I think by the end of the conversation and speaking to staff, their opinion had changed. What staff have said to me and council officers at the consultation is that they have received some really valid, interesting and significant suggestions and information from residents. And that's the whole point of consultation. So those will be, I am sure, or a number of those will be incorporated and we'll hear about that on the, the 20th. It's also important to note that the project um, along the CNC corridor here is an NZTA project primarily with the CNC team involved in Christchurch City Council staff, but it is an NZTA project. So that has been put in place and we are now dealing with the downstream effects from the Innes Road intersection. We are doing what our community has asked us to do and look at how we can mitigate those um, or the increased traffic and congestions. So we're we're actually just doing what our community is asking us to do. So again, it is, I have to say, a little disappointing um, when we are perhaps accused of not doing what we should have and perhaps not doing what we should have done any sooner. This is the soonest that we could do it. So we look forward to that presentation on the 20th. Uh, the second biggest issue in the ward at the moment is still around the Richmond Shirley area and I think, um, again, staff engagement with residents there has been excellent. There have been two or three hiccups, and I'm not going to go into details with it. There were some um, flyers that weren't delivered, and that's been uh, dealt with very, very quickly by staff. And it's unfortunate where we've got a community that is still so raw that these things happen. But again, staff have been fantastic at pulling that back um, and dealing with it. We have a staff meeting, or rather a community meeting, that is scheduled for, whisper in my ear, Christine, Tuesday the, oh no, that we've had that. Uh, the 13th, or the 15th. 13th or 15th of June, so it's in mid-June, um, and this will be to address the concerns of residents, um, and there will be staff there as well, and we're doing a roading audit around the area, because that's clearly a concern with the standard and quality of the roads, so there will be a roading audit, and that information will be presented at that as well, and that's been received positively um, by members of the community. So those are the two main ones. Uh, some positive stuff happening in the ward as well, I mean, obviously the... Um, uh, St Albans Park, that's very positive. The Papua Nui Bush and the Bridgestone Reserve Regeneration Project. We had our second planting day on Tuesday. Uh, John Stringer and Emma Norrish braved the cold weather. We thought it would be um, snowing. Uh, and there were 700 plants planted initially in the first stage in April and the second stage how many did they say? 1,500. 1,500 plants were planted yesterday. Papua Nui High School um, turned out in good numbers, which was excellent. And so that's a very, very positive project to regenerate the native forests and the Bridgestone Reserve. Um, just bear with me while I flick through my notes. Um, we're, we're increasingly uh, buoyed and um, impressed by community organisations engaging with areas of the community. One such project at the moment is the Papua Nui Community Survey. It's being driven by the Papua Nui Baptist Freedom and Northgate Trusts. It started in March at the Papua Nui Neighbourhood Day and it'll go through Octo to October this year. There are 70 individual surveys that have been completed to date. And what this involves is um, social media, Facebook and Neighbourly are also reaching residents. But there's door knocking going on and it's going around the neighbourhood and saying, are you OK? Are there any issues? It's that face-to-face -face, um, contact. And invariably, it throws up issues that we would never have known about in these community groups, would never have known about otherwise. So that is a, a really positive thing that our community groups are doing. Uh, I think that is about all. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I will just flick through. No, that'll do. Got to look at the time at the front end. Um, just quickly, um, Phil and Jimmy. Th thank you, Ali. Um, the, the, the PowerPoint you had around the um, Northern Arterial just seemed to be a section there where there might be potential in terms of public transport to actually have some land set aside for a form of park and ride. Have your board 
considered that yet? Or it's really interesting, Phil. Yeah. We hadn't thought of that actually. I think uh, it's some. Coming through the submissions. Yeah, and yes, yeah. and that's right. Pauline's just said it coming through in the submissions, and and mm. that's where it will come through, yeah. and we can we can address it. But yeah, that's a very good point. Yeah. Very good point. Exactly. So. Because the cycle way, obviously, in getting people using. Yeah. Just in case you didn't know, because that's going to be a very busy road. What we're trying to do too is bring cycle cyclists through McFadden's Road and onto the uh, cycle way that goes down Rutland Street. Mm. So it's sort of taking them off that really busy road. There will be speedy cyclists, much like Mike Davidson, I'm sure, that will use the speedy <laughs> Cranford Street one, but there is an option to take kids, for example, in schools in the area. But, you know, that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, Jimmy? Based on your on page 20, you mentioned the Papa Louis Community Survey. It will uh, be the comments from the uh, March to the October. Why it been uh, take so long, seven months? Well, I think because they're volunteer groups mainly, okay, Jimmy, yes. and you know it's people uh, who are working as well as doing the survey. Okay, uh, yes. There will be tenants who, and, and people who own houses, houses that aren't there, so they'll go back and review. Uh, seasonally, I think it's a good idea to get an idea of what the issues are across a year through the summer and the spring and the winter, which can throw up other issues as well. So yeah, it's a long time, but it gives us really good information, or it gives the organisations really good information. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much. Thank you. So, um, uh, Mike, would you like to move that? Pauline, like to second it? I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Ali. Thank you. Um, uh, Fendleton Waimari, Herewood Community Board. Sam McDonald <laughs> and Matt McClintock. And Aaron as well. Oh, and Aaron as well. Hi, Aaron. <laughs> Good morning. Can I wish Sorry, you a happy morning. birthday in Japanese? <laughs> As they say in Japan, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I, I can't really top that lead, so I'll just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the chance to present our uh, board report. It's relatively light uh, this month in that we've had one meeting. Uh, the second meeting didn't reach quorum because of the LTP submissions and we felt that it was more important that councillors were here uh, than to come out to, to that. Uh, but we've played catch up on Monday and we had quite an extensive meeting. Just a couple of things to touch on. Firstly, there are no parties, but we've got quite a few coming next month, so a heads up on that. Uh, and then as we go through, we've got a bit of a PowerPoint there. Just we thought we'd highlight just a couple of the key things happening in our area at the moment. Just to update you around the Jelly Park Recreational Centre. Uh, so that's still ongoing, and uh, there's the spa pool and the sauna, which have essentially been completed, and there's, there's more being done around the outdoor area. We hope that's done by the end of November. Uh, the Jeffreys Road replacement water tank, and again, that's something that will come to you eventually, is just to uh, I guess signal that, that that's been out for consultation. It's coming to the board, hopefully late June, uh, late June, but it may be early July. So just a heads up on that. Uh, Arbor Day tree planting. You'll see David and Aaron doing the heavy lifting, and I'm the health and safety officer for the day, standing back. Uh, we had that on Monday, which was uh, quite effective and a, and a nice way to start our board meeting. Uh, and before I hand over to Aaron, I just wanted to touch on this one community issue which um, has been in the media recently or in our local papers around parking issues, uh, particularly in my ward and the Waimari ward around the Rusley Business Park. And it's more just a signal that there has been a call. Uh, for, uh, from some locals uh, for resident parking, but we're obviously aware that at the moment we don't have that facility. Uh, again, that's just a highlight to you. Aaron, did you want to yeah, touch on that? Um, yeah, so our group of the month is the Bishop Bell Men's Shed. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge um, Sally Buck um, <coughs> behind me here um, in helping start the group with uh, the, commu the previous community board. Uh, um, not only do they do what they do, which I'm sure you all know, but um, they also helped out um, the the board or the joint boards of uh, Fendleton and um, Hornby Horsel Rickerton with culture galore and doing the kind of the traffic management on the day. So volunteering their their time and their support to um, help not only you know what they're doing there but also the wider community. So um, thank you very much for that. And the only other thing just to note is the community service awards. So uh, we've had 11, 11 nominations in from them uh, and we're working through them at the moment. So they'll be presented to us. Uh, at the upcoming board meeting and then there'll be an, an award ceremony on the 3rd of July. So that's everything from us. But like I say, next month we've got a wee bit to come through. So. I'm, I'm just so taken with this because, I mean, the social enterprise side of it is just, it's actually quite a wonderful, um, 
wonderful thing, and I, I had no idea that was going on. So it's really great that you bring these things <laughs> to the. Should speak more to it. Yeah, well, well please do because yeah. Um, yeah. I just think that um, <coughs> maybe use this as an opportunity. We're live streamed to to tell a little bit about the story because it's fantastic. Um, well, the MedShed's an organisation that's um, spread throughout mm. New Zealand. So if there's people watching online that um, are viewing from other parts of New Zealand, there's there's a MedShed near there, you. There's a MedShed near you. I think there's one in Amberley. Um, I've, I've seen the sign um, uh, when I'm driving past. Uh, so. Yeah, it's a, just a fantastic um, um, spot there to keep um, kind of idle hands, you know, a little bit more active. Uh, also engages the mind. Um, the the men that go along to this, um, you, there's there's, always, there's a shyness that they need to kind of overcome um, because. Sorry. Yeah, 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 absolutely. absolutely. Um, and they're always keen just to, to on that um, for a visit. So if anyone is in the community, mm. there's a couple of days each week where they're there, and, and they're always more than welcome to hear from from any of us. So keep that in mind. Yeah, thank so you. Th there's a um, um, yeah, th there's a reserved nature of uh, New Zealand men that mm. um, uh, you know, to come out of their shell and to kind of interact. That takes a, a big step for some to um, overcome. So the introduction for many can be um, quite slow, but once they get over that and they get mm. get within. Um, the, the organisation it's really good and they are absolutely um, expanding into kind of the uh, you know engaging with women and things like that yeah um, um, so Pauline and Anne mm. yeah yeah thanks this is an incredible program and I know that they've actually Glenn I think the means she have built quite a few planter pots for our social housing units too um, so it's a great community um, donations that they make they do it for community work but my question is what do you do how do you recognise them and what what, what happens with the group of the month? Do they come in and, and have a cup of tea, or do you just send them a congratulations? Um, or in this forum, we're really just highlighting this to council as, as a whole. I really like this idea of group of the month. Mm. I think of all the community boards did a bit of that, and um, I don't know, we could so think of what we could do. Just I'll, I'll really have to um, shout out to Mary Ann for um, helping us um, yeah, kind of me. say, look, we we need to do this. We have so many groups with yeah. and, and every board does have so many groups that do such good work. That's right, mm. and the recognition is really important mm. for these people that are doing mm. so much mm. for Absolutely. others. I and think the great thing about this is they're keen to partner with us as well. So there's a lot of instances where it actually saves the council money oh, and gives yeah. these guys a purpose. So exactly. it's a win-win, really. Like building our planter pots for the social housing units. One yeah. of the um, board reports last year that I presented, um, they were um, making kit sets for um, penguin houses, basically, that school, co school children could then construct. And that would be then presented to um, you know, cons conservation groups uh, along the coastline for, mm. for penguins. Yeah. Um, yeah, Anne? Thank you. Um, Sam, you actually touched on what I was going to ask about yeah, sure. you, the fact that you've part that the Minshed partners with Council on projects. What are some of the projects that, that they do work alongside Council with and how can we strengthen that because it's such a great way forward I think. Yeah, so well, obviously the one that uh, uh, Phil and Glee were talking about in terms of the social housing, so the planter boxes was one of them. Uh, but then as Aaron mentioned as well, the culture galore. So. I mean, for us, it's it's kind of just identifying projects in the area that we're aware, aware of, and Marianne is really good at it, actually, and just connecting the people together to go away and do it. So we don't necessarily need to get in the middle of it, but if we can put the right people in contact, uh, they go on it, and it adds real benefit at a really low cost to the community. They're very keen to activate the space at the, uh, the, the former Bishopdale Library site, uh, which is now just a grassed area. It's kind of roped off. Um, so It would be great for all of our community boards to perhaps you know, focus on that a little bit and on those groups because I think we all have one. It would be good to sort of strengthen that relationship a bit Definitely. more. That would be good. Yeah. Thank you. Look, thank, thank you very much. And um, I'm assuming that Jamie would like to move um, the report and Aaron would like to second it. Um, I will put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's right. carried. Thank, thank you. you. Um, uh, the Linwood Central Heathcote Community Board, and I know I've jumped over one, but that's by request, so um, if we could come forward. Thank you, Sally, Shantai. Nice to see you both. Thank you. Um, yeah, just... Uh, Good morning, everyone. Just before I start, um, 
I just wanted to tell you that um, the Ihuha, the Ihuha, sorry, Ihutai Trust um, has been working on a project since 2009 and they finally got um, this through that the Avon Heathcote <coughs> Estuary has officially received status as a flyway site, network site. Mm. I didn't know if you knew this or not. But it refers to the network of important sites, and that is wetlands used by migratory wetland uh, water birds. Um, and this is a project organised by East Asia Australasian Flyway Partnership. There are only currently two other sites. I'm just. In the I'm just it's been one oh, it has. One okay, sorry. Can, it's just that we, we got an early heads up, but it was kind of like. Please keep this quiet because it's we, we want to announce it. So um, okay. yeah, but you may be announcing it in public. Uh, I don't but, know. but I'm, um, I'm, I'm, that's what I, I was just, just checking, um, and it's on Facebook. We've uh, all had uh, notifications. Uh, I, I, I so it doesn't sound like it is, but I just didn't know if you knew that. Yes, it's, it's absolutely you, fantastic news, um, and we've been wanting to shout it from the rooftop <laughs> since we were told. So please, oh, please. Well, I, I, I um, talk about the status. No it's told fantastic. Not to tell people, so it's yeah. No, 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 it's out there. I was just okay. double checking. So thank you. To do it no, carry on uh, and, and tell um, us about it. It's a fantastic piece of news. It's no, great it, news. It, I just, you know, I just thought it was such a good piece of news to share. That, um, I just wanted to make sure everyone knew. Only three places. Yeah, this is only the third place, isn't it? Yeah, and one of them is farewell spit, and, and the other one's the first of Thames. So, um, you know, I think it's really big news. Yeah, in, in our area. So, it's great. Um, I'll go back to our, um, our board report, and we had no Part A's, and um, we've approved lots of road markings and parking restrictions, as you can see up there. You go to the next one. Um, and we've done lots of um, funding um, for a variety of projects through different um, parts of our funding, a lot of through our discretionary fund. And we a significant council projects. Uh, the biggest one, of course, is that we approved the site for our new um, uh, Linwood Walston pool facility. And um, and as you can see, that it is there, and that's that's really really exciting. Now we're going on to the concept designs, which have to come, which will come back to the board and will go out to the community as well. So it's really good. Um, and we had a visit to see how. Um, the dredging's going on in the Heathcote River at the Wollstone Cut and um, that was, you know, quite amazing out there. Any of you who have, um, who have small boys um, or grandchildren or something and want to see, get them to see some machinery going and this is a great place to take them. Um, now, next one. Um, our public forum's been really well attended and... Uh, you can see some of the things there that uh, people have talked to us about. Uh, I think I think the biggest one there is that um, people came in and talked about the temporary alcohol ban in Linwood Village and how what a um, what a great difference it's making in Linwood Village. We we're really happy. We really want that permanent ban in there, and um, when. Uh, you know, people are saying to us um, that it is making a difference. Um, yep, uh, community ma board matters of interest. We had a proposal from some some people to say they'd really like to see Waltham Park um, revitalised as a community hub where people can enjoy outdoor activities and events. And we'd really like to see that go ahead with... Um, uh, the, the, I think we're doing the SIPTED thing first, aren't we? With uh, it. Yeah, we've organised first um, from our discretionary fund to do a SIPTED um, report on the area to try and make sure we have it safe first and then we'll work from there. Um, yes, this one, um, we have a group that works with this and we have representatives from our board on this and we're paying for a camera on the corner of Aberdeen and Manchester Street from our discretionary fund for security for this um, for this group. And that's going ahead already, that's been approved. Next one. Next one I'd like to talk about a wee bit more. Um, and you've got quite a lot of writing up there which you probably won't be able to read, but basically um, 
In 2017, at our November meeting, we asked staff to urgently meet with the police to discuss the installation and monitoring of closed circuit cameras, closed circuit cameras in the affected areas in the vicinity of Linwood Village and authorise their installation should that be agreed. Um, and um, we asked the staff, so at the December meeting of council, um, they resolved to urgently meet with the police to discuss the installation and monitoring of closed circuit cameras. So we've been waiting since December to see about this um, because we are prepared we are prepared to take this money out of our discretionary fund, but we know that after the earthquakes the council provided the police with a budget to install security cameras around the city and maintain them once installed. And this budget's now been cut, so there's only a budget for maintaining the existing cameras. And the current LTP has no provision for any new security cameras. But like I say, we're prepared to pay for these, but we just need action on this point, you see, because we, we know that they're needed there, we know it's a police priority, and um, we'd really like to see this move ahead as fast as possible. So I'm just wondering if we can have some feedback from staff about how quickly we can get that done. I'll leave that one with you. Um, the installation of flagpoles in Sumner and the, um, the Return Service Association has uh, wants some flagpoles there, we've got a, a recommendation that we provide information on the installation of flagpoles and we will be prepared to pay for this, but I think that it's not necessarily, I think the, um, the Return Services Association may pay for those. But we did have, we did have a flagpole on the old Sumner Community uh, Centre building prior to the earthquakes. So. They like it, but they want one for the um, Anzac Day services. Thanks. Uh, water fountains, we, um, like you see, we um, had $20,000 um, from the um, last year's annual plan process allocated to fountains in the central city, and um, staff are identifying suitable sites for this, but we've also asked them to look right across our board area for other possible sites as well. Um, the other thing I'd like to bring to your attention is something that Coastal Burwood raised with you, and that's the fact of the um, HFZMA zone, where uh, the flooding zone around all the coastal areas, where we're getting people who are buying sections in the Red Cliffs type area, where and paying huge amount of money for it and then being told they can't get a resource consent to build on there. So <coughs> we've organised, we're currently organising to have a seminar with hopefully with planning staff to have some sort of um, resolution for this because it's going to be, end up as um, <coughs> a, an issue which will get a lot of airing in, I think, in the newspaper if we don't get something organised with it. Yeah. I think that's all today. Thank you very much. Um, I think that um, final issue's been raised with the, with the council and um, from an organisational point of view, we do need to have a, a better understanding of how the um, district plan rules, uh, which which have been implemented through the yeah. independent hearings panel process. Uh, our staff are, are working out. on a seminar for us, I think, yeah. to try and understand this, but I think it's, <coughs> it's a coastal bill with joint thing with us It, it is well. a joint thing, yeah, yeah. very much so, but and we, Banks Peninsula we'd as really well. I'd really like you to, um, those cameras for Linwood Village would be a big priority for us. Thank moment. you. Thank you. Thank you for your um, long-term plan, but um, at, in, your, in your report, I, we but haven't got time for, for questions. We just um, need the work done. So, uh, moved by Dion, receipt of the report, seconded by Yanni. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye, those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. Um, so, back to Hallsville, Hornby, Rickton Community Board. Ross McFarlane, Gary Watson. Morning, Ross. Good morning, Mayor, uh, councillors, staff. Um, thanks for the opportunity. 
pretty short from us, fortunately. Um, just uh, our delegated decisions were um, a couple of small um, parking decisions, there's nothing critical there, um, but probably just in our delegation we uh, just granted a lease to uh, Conservation New Zealand. Conservation Volunteers New Zealand London. and um, these people are going to reside at um, the former manager's house at mm. Quarry, um, Horsel Quarry. It's great. It was built mm. in 1927. It's a good shot of the, the um, facility there. It can accommodate up to eight people in there, and the manager will um, have a day office in the bottom area down there. Um, this group have uh, very impressive set of statistics, um, and I'll just gloss over them. In the last 12 months, um, they planted 158,000 trees, propagated 128,000, weeded 650 hectares, removed 3,800 kilograms of rubbish, put in 100,000 volunteer hours, and supported nationally over 300 community groups. This was an absolute win for us to get uh, these people here. They have um, facilities in Auckland, Wellington, Punakaiki and Dunedin. And um, what will happen here is they will reside there and then they will be tasked in association with our uh, park rangers team, um, A, work within the quarry itself uh, in the wider area and also able to be offered to third party organisations. And I think you'll recall the long term plan you had a submission from the Orton Bradley Trust, which um, Pam and team mentioned early. Um, if there's time available, they can venture over there for days at a time and work away there. I think you'll recall they lost their corrections department um, labour. So there's a, an ability to fill that little hole there. So, um, yeah, five year lease, uh, complete um, alcohol drug free policy up there. It won't be party paradise, believe me, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, but, um, yeah, just a really good um, synergy, I suppose, with, um, with that group. So, um, uh, moving on, um, leadership groups, um, the engagement team. Um, had the um, leadership day on the um, 3rd of May. Um, over 39 people or local leaders took place and um, I think a lot of them were, were youth and uh, very, again, just a really worthwhile get together and um, it was able to um, to engage those people and where they go from there, well, obviously we don't know. Just staying on that one, we also have coming up 27th of June our um, Community Service and Youth Service Awards. We've got 10 Community Service Awards, um, two Youth Service Awards, and a number of certificates of appreciation for people. Um, next one, Gary, is uh, this one was um, partnered in um, tandem with the Oak Development Trust in Rickardham. This is, uh, was absolutely brilliant to have um, old Ray, an older fella, 85 year old, come to our board and speak how he had never cooked in his life. And between him and his wife, they decided that either one of them or the other was going to go first, which could leave him to have to repair, prepare the meals. So um, this group engaged a professional chef and they're going to do this on an ongoing basis over the next two years um, just to um, help those people, older, younger, uh, migrants, etc., just to be um, more prepared and um, more resilient in their own communities should they have to, in the advent, um, prepare for themselves. Um, the other component of that is um, with the uh, migrant groups, um, our ward-based board members have been working to um, promote um, an emergency resilience plan, which is just, um, I suppose, preparing them should uh, the worst happen in their communities with um, various things up and operating. Our four critical um, networks in our ward area are the Horsville Liaison Group, Hornby Community Workers Luncheon, the Rickenham Network Liaison Group, and uh, the Invent Youth Workers Forum. These were all groups that were originally initiated by our, our community engagement teams and um, now they've virtually all been taken over uh, under the wing of the community facilitated operations. So, 
Moving on. Um, yeah, big one coming up, or just completing really in, in our area is the, the Rickerton Road upgrade. Um, it's been a huge effort, this one, uh, over a long time. Uh, things will set and settle down until the next stage, which is from Harry Kiki Street through to, um, to um, Matapo Street. Major sewer upgrade, major upheaval, um, busiest uh, bus route in Canterbury and of course past the um, Westfield Mall. Tender process is imminent and the contractor hopefully to be appointed in October. Um, Fulton Cahogan who have just completed the road repairs for the first stage come along to our board and they've initiated a new process whereby they're putting down what we used to, you know, Tarsia Welsh felt was about this thick. In this case, it's, it's about this thick. So it's really a long-term fix. Um, done well, done properly, given the, um, the obvious upheaval to the whole community based on um, um, the works in the area. That's a really good long-term. Costs a wee bit more, but, um, you know, you get what you get. Um, Recently, um, this was a, a bit of a sad story with a, with a good ending. Um, the Upper Memorial Library um, was forcibly closed by our um, staff um, engineers because of an unsafe building. One of those difficult scenarios where the, the community owned the building, but the uh, council owned the land underneath it. And as landowners, we are liable as an entity should something occur had a walkway, as you can see, just beside the container there, public walkway. It had to be closed, which meant, um, obviously, everything had to come out of that building. Um, in this case, um, 14 council staff took it on themselves, along with some community board members and their families, to um, clear that library out. Just a really worthwhile day. Um, it was the engineers that had to shut it down. It was the engineers that turned up in their own time to do that work to empty that library and the feedback we got from there, from that elder group at the library. It's just wonderful to know that so many angels are still out there in Christchurch after we've all been through what we have in our city. So nice feedback. Yeah. Um, um, so moving on. Um, yeah, a couple of them, a bit like um, Kashmir sprayed and with a couple of halls in the area which are, you know, do we fix, do we not? Um, you know, there's a use there, but is it a sustainable use? I'm not sure. But yeah, this one, of a bit of a tongue twister, Mike told me that I've got to get out the hyper-helpful random facts. Um, just a bit of information on the former Templeton Hospital site, was closed close to 20 years ago now. It's a unique area which still has an a institutional base, uh, but not quite the ring fence that used to happen to the community for Templeton. Uh, Nova Trust, which is residential drug and alcohol program. Innovation Park, which does some agribusiness and research, 13 tenants in that. Bracken Ridge, which is the supporting people with uh, intellectual disabilities. Westmont School, which is a private um, Brethren church-based school, and there's the um, Temple Dredden Chapel in there all, also. Um, tagged in there as well as the Waitaha School. Waitaha School's recently relocated to um, a school called Temple, T sorry, Lemonwood Grange in Rolleston. However, they're setting up a sub-site in the new um, Nightstream School in Hallsville, and that's um, very much integrating some of these um, um, disability-based, intellectual-based um, facilities within the community. So uh, a win-win there. Uh, other than that, um, that's all from out west. All things are relatively stable, being considered. So happy to take some questions. No, no, I think we, ha we haven't got time for questions, so we've reached our 10 minutes. So thank you very much. It's okay. a very good, very good Thanks time again. submission. Uh, Jimmy Chen would like to move, and Galloway would like to second. And I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. But thank you very much. And that's the conclusion of the community board reports. And we'll move on to the chief executive report. Brendan.
Uh, thanks, Mayor. I'd just like to uh, bring a small number of matters to uh, the attention of councillors. I'll take the report as read. Um, both the uh, Mayor and um, Kim Money uh, have already talked this morning about the successful opening of Tyra um, and uh, the 14,000 people through over Queen's Birthday uh, weekend, and um, that project was brought in uh, under budget and on time. So, um, fantastic event there. Uh, and we've talked uh, about Jelly Park, um, but also just to um, bring to councillors' attention that the refurbished Pioneer Rec and Sports Centre uh, opened earlier uh, in May. Um, the LTP has both kept councillors busy but also staff busy and there's um, commentary in the report on that. Uh, I note the successful uh, election of Tyrone Fields following the uh, by-election uh, to the Banks Peninsula Community Board. Uh, and just finally um, uh, included uh, um, in your information is a supplementary report and uh, the Mayor's also circulated um, some separate information uh, regarding the appointment of Helen Beaumont uh, to lead the um, improvements to the water program. So um, this is recognition um, uh, that the um, experiences that we've had to date um, and historically with uh, what was known as the Mayor Task Force uh, for flooding um, uh, this is a type of project that does require dedicated um, and skilled expertise uh, and the appointment of Helen to this role um, uh, we think will make a, um, a measurable difference to um, the quality of the outputs uh, that we're getting. Um, and we think this is a, a recognition of um, the talents and expertise that Helen also brings to the role. Um, she's well known um, to councillors, has got the technical background and um, a, a very um, experienced um, in water matters. So um, uh, we're looking forward to um, her getting her feet under um, the desk here. She's already started uh, in the role. The appointment is reporting directly to the Chief Executive. Uh, it's for 12 months. The reason uh, for the 12 month appointment is that it, um, her role is expected to both manage uh, the Wellheads Improvement Programme, the uh, temporary, temporary chlorination, uh, but also to prepare and ensure that we are um, uh, in the right position to respond to any central government changes um, which might go well beyond the 12-month period. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you, Leanne. Thank you. Um, Jamie. It's more of a suggestion I wonder if you could take it back to Carleen but it's uh, I'm finding the this less helpful than what it used to be I, I think it's um you know and thank you for that and thank you for the commentary around that that last bit but just by way of a suggestion I don't know what other councillors think but I really like the dashboard approach which used to be taken and I'm finding that it's sort of gravitating more to a newsletter approach which is fine and there's look some good stuff in there but it's just being able to track that progress with things so it's like service delivery capex op opex key metrics maybe uh the major projects and how they're tracking or IT rollout and that sort of stuff and then just a dashboard approach around year to date versus full year and budget actual and then variance and then forecast actual and variance that sort of stuff is really helpful in a CE's report um, so I just I, that's a suggestion from me that um, that dashboard approach on some of those key metrics are really helpful and the newsletter approach stuff is great but a lot of the stuff we already know and, we're, and are briefed on so that's just my two cents worth on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, if possible, please. Yeah, okay. Depending on what I'm listening to. Yeah. Um, Yanni? Thank you. Um, just two, two, two questions. One is, in regards to the um, chlorination issue, um, are we able to get an understanding of progress in terms of how many wellheads have, have been secure and get some more regular reporting on progress? Um, and related to that, are we able to produce a map showing where people can get um, either filtered water or non non chlorinated water? Um, I mean, I don't quite know how we get progress on the on these issues. They have been emailed through, raised. Um, I'm happy to take those two issues back to the um, team and pass that on to um, Helen and the team. Yeah. Right. I think so, there's a report coming to council next week, so um, and uh, I don't know that the second issue will be covered off on that, but the first issue certainly will be. So um, because there's a lot of there's a lot of work 
that has been going on for months now in relation to assessing each of the wellheads in relation to their pumping station because as we know the chlorine goes in at the pump not at the wellhead and um, and we want to reduce the amount of chlorine going into the water as quickly as possible with the intention of removing it as soon as we possibly can altogether. So, um, so in terms of the report next week, if we've got ideas for things like that have been raised, you know, maybe council um, selling at cost water filters or maybe having filling stations at our service centres and libraries for non chlorinated water, is that the time? To, to raise those issues? Yes, so raise them then, because I mean, okay. literally, um, Helen Beaumont, and I really welcome uh, the um, focus that the Chief Executive's brought to this issue, um, because what it signals is an <coughs> overarching approach, recognising that this is not just a council issue, it's a Ministry of Health issue, it's a drinking water assessor issue, it's a medical officer of health issue, um, and it's obviously of primary concern, it's a community issue. They want to get back to chlorine free as soon as possible, and so do we. Um, Tim. Thank you. Look, I sent through to Carlene, and it's actually from a resident, although I'd love to take the credit, I can't, um, about a regular update here, and now Helen's in place, because you're absolutely right, this is a city issue, a residence issue, a ratepayers issue, and probably the single most important issue. Yep. Second, uh, even over above the LTP, to have the um, live updates, so we are live streamed, and to have the odd update to councillors is, I think, great, but for the residents, a waste of time. So I think to have Helen or somebody doing a, a regular update here and, and, and live would be a really helpful thing, and um, Carlene agreed with that. So. Yeah, there's also a blog that's now developed through Newsline, which is being regularly updated as well. So the, the blog will now um, contain Helen's new role, and uh, and she'll be in front of the council next week. Mm. Yeah. So it's been enormously challenging for her to take the role up last Friday, and she's in front of council next Thursday. Yeah. Yes. That, that's a very good idea. Thank you. Um, who had their hand up? Dion? Just on the resource consent stuff, um, you, you say that you're doing a review of the engagement strategy. A, a number of, of us around the table always get sort of, you know, complaints about the resource consenting process and stuff like that. Can we feed into that review? Of course. Thank you. That'd be good. Good. Any other questions? No. Would someone like to move that the report be received, Tim? Seconded by Mike. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you. And we'll move on to my report. Um, that's the next item. Yes, it is. And, um, uh, and as I've identified in there, um, May has been a very busy month for all councillors with the LTP hearings dominating proceedings and obviously working through the myriad of issues that has raised. Um, the drinking water supply, as I said, I've asked management to focus the next report on the work required to further reduce the chlorine being added to the system. So that's that regular um, approach to just keeping the foot on the pedal, as it were. Um, and so I really welcome um, the announcement from the Chief Executive about the appointment of Helen Beaumont and her ability to report to us through the Chief Executive directly. I mean, I think it's a, a very good reporting regime and it's um, it's going to see action um, taken. I think often preliminary assessment work that's necessary um, isn't seen as action, um, but I can assure you if we can switch off wellheads um, and that allows the pump not to be chlorinated, recognising that there are certain pressure levels that have to be maintained, then that achieves part of the purpose and we're on our way to getting to chlorine free. So um, the, you know, I can reassure councillors that work is going on um, very hard behind the scenes. I was um, more than disappointed to be told the cost of reinstating the town hall had gone over budget. 
it was very late advice, only a month before we were told it was on track. Um, and we were put under pressure to um, sign off on the additional funding because it was we, we needed to sign contracts for the final piece of work. Um, the media uh, were going to be briefed on site in June, but um, inattention, and I'll take responsibility for that, to the PX release date created a false impression that we were holding this back. There was no intention. It was always going to be released this month. Um, and so I've asked the Chief Executive to ensure that um, release recommendations are now included in all PX papers and she has actioned that request um, and uh, as I've said on many occasions the total project is still well under what a brand new facility would have cost. We've saved a heritage building and the CSO has a permanent home. Um, I think there's been uh, some uh, misleading um, commentary which has suggested that this reduces the amount that's available in the performing arts precinct, that nothing could be further from the truth. Um, the additional funding for this has not come from the performing arts um, uh, um, delivery side of thing, which still has the same amount of money on budget. Uh, for the um, for the uh, completion of the um, building on the other the other element, the other part of the performing arts precinct. So um, the, the rest of my report is all the um, good news um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Vicky. Uh, one that I didn't think was quite such good news um, was the statement on the public transport, um, that the regional public transport plan that we worked, had a workshop on. Um, what concerns me is that this council has already asked that, um, that that committee seek uh, full electrification of the public transport fleet by a certain date. So we understand that it will happen tomorrow, but there needs to be a timeline by which it does happen. So will that go to the, um, to the joint committee, and what further possibility is there for the public to be involved uh, in attempting to change the model that we currently operate, which is very much a race to the bottom in terms of public transport. Yeah. So the um, what what the um, joint committee members have been given is an early draft, um, and that's what we've workshopped. So all of the workshop um, ideas, and I can say that Christchurch City will be um, promoting the the electrification um, of the bus fleet as part of that. Um, they'll come back to the Joint Committee uh, on the 20th of June for consideration uh, and then it goes out for public consultation. So there'll be an, a, a, a very um, a significant period of time available for public consultation and we will do our bit to ensure that that is publicised widely and that people do have um, their say. Great, and is that run by the Joint Committee or is that run by ECAN? It's run by the joint committee on this occasion, right. which has the the, the yep. ECAN cannot delegate the decision, but they can delegate the okay. formalities, and so there will be a <laughs> hearings panel established at the joint committee. I doubt it. It'll be a hearings panel, I imagine. Right. Mike, do you remember? Who's the, do you remember whether, no, I just can't remember the, the numbers that are on the hearings panel, but um, they haven't established the hearings panel yet. The public hearings, public submissions will be called for and there will be a hearings panel established and they will hear the submissions. Do that hearings panel have to be the members of the joint public transport? Joint I don't know the answer to that question, but I expect that they will be. I'm happy to volunteer for them. No, I, vol I volunteered to um, I volunteered to nominate you to the committee, and you refused to be part of it. So I'm not going <laughs> to uh, support your nomination to the hearings panel. <laughs> um, Thank you, um, Oscar Alper's advice to new, newly elected members was question everything. So with the town hall, can we put in place some kind of structure, or you know, either an existing one with one of our standing committees, or a new one that looks at applying the blowtorch in a respectful way with staff, but 
I get pretty frustrated over, um, you know, that the inflation bit. But a slight yeah, hand. no, I, I agree entirely, and yeah. that's why I've already discussed with councillors the concept of establishing a capital program committee, which is sole focus is the capital program, all of it, um, and that's uh, the you know the the, the large um, projects and then the programs of work that sit underneath it. So um, yes, no, we've 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 certainly. Um, picked up and that's why I said in there we need to lift our game on monitoring the capital program and that's why I've raised that with councillors, I've raised that with the chief executive, she also thinks that's a very good idea um, and uh, it's I think um, an important way forward. Um, and it's the, the, the issue um, in relation to, to this matter though was that um, as I understand it the uh, the chief executive is going to sort of provide some feedback on on the how this happened and as you also know um, part of the resolution of this particular matter was to agree a new process for signing off on the um, contingency which is now no longer at the project management level it is now lifted right up to the to the um, general manager level so that it, it can't just be signed off. Yeah, I, I agree and we just need straight communication like the say what you mean mean what you say stuff. I'm yeah. it's tight, really frustrated. Tight, so. tight um, yeah. controls is yeah. what we want to see from a governance perspective and, um, and a, a good uh, clear reporting structure that is uh, across the board um, at the moment we've got different projects reporting to different committees and I think that having a, you know, a, you know and I've sort of said a Rottweiler approach um, at, the, at, the, um, at the head of it will, um, but as I agree with you, it, entirely respectful but there is a, um, there is a provision um, in relation to how, um, yeah, there is a provision in terms of how how it's, uh, how it's reported, so we've, we've got to tighten up. Um, Yanni. <coughs> Thank you. You, um, in your report, make reference to the Red Zone Futures. I just wondered if you could just give us a very quick um, explanation around the decision making around the Red Zone Futures, particularly because we are getting lobbied as individual councillors for certain projects, and just wondered if you could just clarify in terms of our role as elected members as a city council in terms of what happens there versus regenerate and the minister because I think it would be quite beneficial for people to have a clear understanding. Sorry, uh, ask that again. I'm <coughs> got so sorry. for the um, red zone futures, the Otakaro Avon River Corridor the Otakaro, is yeah. open for feedback um, and obviously we've been getting a number of emails from individuals concerned over certain projects, whether they should be in. Um, so can you just give us a kind of clear understanding of the process around the decision making around the um, projects that are going to be happening in the red zone going forward and what our role is? No, that, well that's, that's not uh, what the exhibition's about. So um, I, I honestly <coughs> thought that Regenerate Christchurch had already reported to us on the, on the process going forward but um, I've yeah, it's not my function to, to report on the process going forward as part of this report. We've had Regenerate Christchurch right. in front of so, the committee yesterday. Well, as I understand it, we're not making decisions on the future of the Red Zone as a council. That's a matter for Regenerate Christchurch. No, it's not. It's a matter for signing off by the Minister. Okay. It is a process that's under the Greater Christchurch Regeneration Act. And what Regenerate Christchurch is doing is developing a regeneration plan which will be signed off by the Minister, not by the Council. Right. Yeah. Okay. But we will be submitting on it, obviously. Dave. David. Just, just carrying on um, from that subject with Yanni, um, what is the process then? I mean, Yanni's quite <coughs> clearly indicated that a number of us are being lobbied by certain groups about projects that may or may not be um, in, in the program at the moment. What is our role in that particular uh, function there where we are now starting to hear 
a lot of noise from certain sectors of the community over the plan that Regenerate have come up with. Do we have any role or input to say to yeah, Regenerate? Look, clearly or? there's a misunderstanding. Regenerate Christchurch are not deciding the particular projects that are going to be developed on the site. They're but developing a regeneration plan which allows for certain projects to proceed in particular areas um, should they be uh, resourced to do so. Um, and But that's a separate program project, program, it's a separate process after the regeneration plan is, is resolved. So they're out there with the exhibition now about the specific areas. They've said that the green spine will be a given um, in terms of the in terms of the regeneration plan. We can take that as read. Um, there are three areas which they've asked for further input from the community in relation to their views about what uses those um, particular pieces of land could be put to. So um, I think that one of the issues that's come up more than once is the, is the temporary use. And I have to say that I'm not entirely um, fussed with the process that, that uh, sits around temporary use. We, we, we do need a stronger um, utilisation of the uh, red zone for temporary purposes for up to five years in different areas. Um, some of these project decisions won't be made uh, for years, you know, in terms of um, the, the permanent use in some of the areas, depending on how long it takes to fundraise for particular options that may or may not be able to proceed. So, um, but look, why don't we just get Regenerate Christchurch and we'll get them um, in front of the council at a, at a meeting such as this, uh, perhaps the next one um, before the uh, before um, the submissions close on the exhibition uh, and uh, we'll get them to repeat what they have said to uh, um, different workshops that certainly I've been to out in the community um, explaining the process. Um, it's all dedicated to on their website but um, I know that not everyone will have read all of the details so we'll get them into the into a meeting we'll get them in front of the live stream and they can explain the process um, in front of everyone all right well does anyone want to move my report <laughs> Dion hey just quickly wanted to make a comment. Oh, well, I'll... I'm I'll, happy to move it or we'll second it. Well, well, you can second it then. Yeah. Oh, no, just quickly, I think um, the most important thing is that the community understand how these decisions are going to be made. So, I mean... <clears throat> yeah, and what role we have to influence that, so... But why are you doing... <clears throat> Why? So, I mean, on the back of my report, I've just said we'll get regenerate Christchurch. You've said you don't understand the process. No, no, I, I understand that we'll be asked to give our feedback at some stage That's right. in terms of a regeneration plan. What I don't understand is how the community, in terms of their feedback to us as elected members, how we incorporate that into our feedback. So, whether we have a specific consultation, yes, of whether, course, we do. We're a strategic, we, we do that. So um, I just think it's good, it would be good to give some clarity, given that we are getting a number of emails from people. I've just over the said process. we'll bring Great. Regenerate Christchurch here next next meeting. Yeah, but it's not to us. I think it's to the community that needs that clarification. And understanding. I'll, I'll circulate as well the um, link to the Regenerate Christchurch website, which has got a dedicated section on the process in um, what they've described as the braid. Um, you'll also be conscious um, that it is under the Greater Christchurch Regeneration Act, which has um, uh, got a clearly specified process, and you can share that, Yanni, with um, uh, um, your um, the people who are asking you so that so that they do understand it and we'll get Regenerate Christchurch in to reiterate it. Yeah, the irony... I think it's the process for us to develop our feedback is what I'm asking. Yes, but we don't need to do that right now and you don't need to do it off the back of my report. You know, if I hadn't mentioned that I'd been to the opening of the exhibition, you wouldn't have raised any of these issues. So, <laughs> you know... I, I'm, I'm just wondering whether my reporting is redundant, um, whether I shouldn't bother. Is that? 
Yeah. Okay, so it's been moved and it's been seconded, so I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Right. Um, we'll move on to the um, Zone Committee's um, annual reports and quarterly updates. And uh, we've got uh, Paula Smith and Ara Tata Rubin and Alan Lim. Kia ora and welcome. Thanks for the help with the pumpkin, Alan. Welcome. <laughs> uh, you did actually, yep. yep. You, you, you haven't been told uh, the weight though, have you? Um, I think it was about 60.8, so you're about 10 kgs uh, um, ahead of the next uh, closest competitor. <laughs> and I think... Uh, Yes, and, I think, <laughs> yeah. and uh, honestly, I don't actually know how you did it because um, you got your seedling a whole month later than everyone else. It was the Otaipuro Community Orchard that did all the hard work. I just planted the it. Yeah, well, well done anyway, so congratulations. And um, I, uh, I don't know how the first one exploded either. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, he was no nowhere near yours, so he was. Yeah. I didn't even weigh his because it was so small. So. <laughs> yeah. But look, oh, so it's been a big year for um, for Selwyn Wahoro Zone Committee. Um, of course, you know, early in the year, uh, Selwyn River went dry, and. Um, following about two and a half years of uh, dry winters, so they had very little recharge. Uh, so th the lead on from that was that we um, ran a series of uh, seminars at Lincoln University uh, covering seven topics. Uh, there was a seminar at lunchtime and at, uh, in the evening. We had about 70 to 130 people attending each time. Um, so it was, the intent was actually to let the community know what we've actually done uh, in the water management space in the in the in the zone, uh, and that was very very uh, well received. Um, and I, I think you know, the pumpkin project probably born was born out of that um, because we thought that we didn't actually reach enough people. Still, so. uh, the next one, next highlight is actually um, that there's been. 95% of the 356 priority farms that have taken actions you know, required for their farm. Uh, so it's, it's all going well there in terms of kind of consenting. Uh, the other highlight for the year was that nearly 2.7 million uh, of the government's money, the, the Freshwater Improvement Fund, was allocated to projects in our zone. Uh, and one of them uh, was actually directly uh, to address the water shortage in the Selwyn uh, River. So from the CPW uh, stage two pipe that runs across under the, the river, we've taken a, a bit of water from there, we're putting an offtake in there uh, to recharge the, um, uh, uh, the, the basin, if you like, um, so that it won't run dry again. And we'll be taking water from there you know, in the off season when the farmers aren't using it for irrigation. Um, and of course, you know, our zone is probably one of a few that have actually managed to spend um, all our immediate steps money um, in the um, uh, what 100,000 in last year. So we <coughs> basically spent um, 100,000 every single year in the last so many years now. And other zones are, uh, are here uh, struggling to spend theirs. Uh, that's about all from me. If, if you've got any questions that you want to ask. Sorry about that, I was just um, sidetracking onto the um, Banks Peninsula Zone Committee request, so 
we're getting we're getting some wording together that will um, that we can um, resolve that. Does anyone have any questions for Alan? Glenn? Yeah, thank, thank you for this, and I, I just need to be careful not to make generalisations. But you just said before, uh, so it won't run dry again. The Selwyn River. Um, so you're seeking to. Um, you know, give effect to recharge when farmers aren't using it again. So during the so CPW um, water, uh, I guess they, you know, they're taking that water from the Rakaia River and they only use it uh, to irrigate their land in the summer months. So if there was going to be a dry winter, if we know that you know that, uh, there hasn't been enough recharge during those during that period. Uh, we can put water into the ground that essentially kind of keep the bathtub full, if you like, because you know there's just a huge amount of water underneath the plains. Right. And if there hasn't been recharged here for a few years in a row, that kind of thing, then the, the river's going to run dry again. Uh, with this project, you know, we can keep keep the bathtub topped up, and so we never there's any kind of more water, you know, at all, just yeah. coming out in the in the rivers and springs in the lower plains. Yeah, we, we know the farming sector is feeling picked on, so I just wanted to make sure, you know, are we making too great a leap to say it's due to uh, it's, some aspect of farming such as irrigation? It's due to both. Okay. So due to um, <coughs> extraction you know, by, by the farmers and, and it's also due to the lack of uh, um, recharge. Okay. So in the typical year you, know, you might get about um, you know, 25 cubics of uh, recharge. And the farmers will take part of that, and part of it kind of goes down um, the river and out to sea. Yeah. Do you know how much of that 25 they take? Uh, I'm not sure exactly, but it'll probably be in the vicinity of 10, maybe 15. Okay. 10 of the recharge, so over half. Yeah. I'm, don't quote me on that one. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Oh, David, sorry. <coughs> um, yeah, just a, a comment I'd like to make to the uh, meeting today. And so I actually attended the um, Central Trains Water Annual Meeting last year, and um, they have, uh, as a consequence of the finishing stages of that project, a number of ores that were extracting up to a million cubic um, litres of water have now been discontinued. So we are um, uh, moving towards a, a more sustainable um, use of water in that area rather than um, just that sort of compliment. Yeah, that, that's correct. That's the intent of the uh, CPW scheme, yeah. to, is to retire some of that groundwater so that more can stay in the, in the ground. Yeah. I wasn't going to raise the Central Plains water, yeah. but I'm not, I'm not allowing that. Um, Comment to go unchallenged. Could you explain to me, please, the the additional water irrigation <coughs> from Central Plains Water? I'm assuming that makes um, dairy farming in that area more um, economically viable. I think it gives it more certainty. Mm. Yeah. So I I don't know about the viability part of it. Um, not to those figures. And what about does your board or is it just the um, West Melton one deal with the Leaching of nitrates under the WIMAC. And well, <coughs> I know it's in the West Melton one, but your board doesn't touch on that at all. No. Right. Okay. Uh, Anne? Yep. Just um, I want to thank you, Alan, and all the, the committee for the amazing work that you do out there. I think you've got fantastic engagement with the community. It's a very difficult um, issue often. Um, I particularly enjoyed the other day um, hearing <coughs> about the people that are working with the farmers from Fonterra to, to um, raise their standards of, of practice. Have you got two or three points that you could make in terms to us in terms of the improvement that's being seen in the practice of some of the dairying farmers? Yes, yeah, so, um, that's happening all the time. Um, I guess there's been quite a bit of talk about you know, moving farmers to different farming systems and so on. But it's got to be led with research. You know, um, you, know, you can't expect a farmer to kind of make changes unless they know what uh, those changes are effective. And um, um, yeah, so I guess you know they won't leap into it unless it's, it's proven. So there's actually a whole lot of uh, research being done, not just in dairy but in, in all sectors. Uh, and a lot of improvement has already been made, and farming systems are changing. And it hasn't actually been that long, you know, since the, this issue in some ways. 
Would it be um, appropriate for you to include in your next report some of the things that we learnt about from the Fonterra uh, people that are working with the farmers? Yeah, so, so we did actually ask for the information as well. They, you know, they haven't actually got all the details yet either. Uh, things are just moving very, very quickly. <laughs> so we will be looking for those kind of numbers where we're interested in it uh, ourselves. And so um, if, it's, if there's interest here, I'll, uh, I'll try to bring some of those numbers back for the next report. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now I'm not sure which, which committee would like to report next. West Mel Crushage, West Melton. After you, sir. Uh, good morning, my name's Lance Kenyon. Um, I'm filling in for Arapara here, since apologies. Thank you. Um, I'm a community member on the Crushage, West Melton Zone Committee. Um, our annual report, um, I had done a little spiel, but unfortunately I'm struggling with glasses, so we'll see again. Um, <laughs> You will be a, a, aware of the phrase hitangata, hitangata, hitangata. And one of the things for our zone committee is that is a crucial part of what we've been trying to achieve in 2017 and going forward as well. Um, there's a lot of good work being done, as you can see in our report. Um, and we, are like um, Selwyn, have also spent all of our allocated funds um, for the immediate steps. Uh, one of those was uh, the whole... Um, this year, just finishing, we spent it all, sorry, allocated it all to the Port Hills recovery uh, up on Worsley Spur um, to assist with plantings and putting in some pest control fencing um, because it's an unprecedented event, obviously, and if we can get an opportunity to put a lot of um, biodiversity back into the area and help uh, stop the lows coming down into the Heathka de Pawaho, we thought that that was um, a, a great way to be involved. Um, we hope that that can be um, taken further. Um, you'll see also in the report there is a, another initiative that we have been involved with, which was started by one of our committee members, which is around the copper brake pad issue uh, and raising the awareness of how much copper is going into the stormwater system. Um, and I understand that the Mayor and the um, ECAN Chairman are looking at putting a letter to the uh, Minister of the Environment regarding the copper brakes issue. Um, we have also designed a postcard uh, that is going to be uh, passed out that sort of highlights that issue to the community as well so that they can be aware there is an alternative to the current um, break pads. Um, so that's, that's ongoing. Um, I know that the, uh, the, the Waimakariri was raised. Um, our groundwater sub, uh, subgroup has been instrumental in identifying uh, the groundwater protection area and making sure what's shown on the maps is actually what is being done. Um, they did a lot of great work and it is our intention this month uh, to hold a workshop around the Waimakariri and I understand that yourselves and Ikan are getting some updates tomorrow. Um, we are getting uh, our one in two weeks as well um, and some of our zone committee members attended uh, the Waimakariri's um, workshop last month as well so they've got a, a little bit more information. So we're still waiting to get some more details. Um, biodiversity is something else that is important um, to our uh, zone committee. And we, as I said, we allocated the whole 100,000 to the Port Hills uh, this financial year just finishing and also gave a, a number of other um, fundings to things such as the Mount Vernon up by the rock wall there um, going up onto Mount Vernon track. Um, we are very keen to see some more involvement around riparian plantings, particularly the tributaries coming off the Port Hills, because again, uh, we're looking at something perhaps in the future as a catchment-wide initiative that we'd like to uh, get some involvement, um, such as the red zone areas up on the Port Hills, perhaps there's an opportunity there uh, to reduce some of that sediment coming down into the river. Um, and I understand that the Milling Trees Fund criteria is coming out in July, and obviously our zone committee would like to be uh, involved in that once it is, is known. Um, lastly, our committee's had three refreshes, um, and Andrew Congleton and Chris Kelleher have stood down, and they did some amazing work, and Andrew continues to support our group, so I'd just like to publicly acknowledge them in this forum. Um, thank you for your support on our zone committee. We really do appreciate it, and anything you can do to help with the waterways, our water quality, of course, and anything to do with biodiversity, which um, uh, you know about the Inaka uh, scheme from last year, um, we would like to continue. Um, and I'll ask Pauline if she's got anything to add. 
Pauline. Right. Oh, no, just, um, yeah, the, I think the committee's just getting uh, stronger and better, actually. It's got good cohesion, uh, good facilitation as well. Um, but I was actually going to, and I think it's a really good um, a good update here showing the, the, um, what we have achieved over the last year. Um, but I was going to ask a question about the Waimakariri Wells. Um, and on page 63, councillors, you'll see it's just noted there in a small paragraph, but it does say that modelling has indicated that nitrates may find their way into deep groundwater, but I think the modelling showed that it is present. Is that correct? Or the testing has showed that it is there is a very small amount. Yeah, there. Lance Lance identified himself as a community member of the zone committee, so yeah, he's I, I'm assuming we're getting some technical support now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not so much technical support, but um, certainly it did indicate that there could possibly be some nitrates coming into some of the deeper aquifers, and I think that you've had a briefing about. The model and showed that we thought it was kind of like a rabbit proof fence, and we weren't sure how deep that rabbit proof fence, which is the Waimakariri River, went down. Mm. Modeling shows that um, you know, it could possibly have gone under. Uh, those test boils showed that yes, there was possibly some indication that, that that could be the case. Because I think the key thing here is the word deep aquifers, because previously. Well, as you know, we've upgraded our, um, our deep bore program in the northwest there, thinking that we would be safe by turning off our shallow bores. But this is a, actually a considerable concern, and the zone committee is taking this very seriously. And I'm just wondering, Leslie, if you could expand on the steps we're taking to work with Waimakariri Zone Committee in order to address this. Yes, certainly. So there was a technical briefing uh, last month on this, so it was an opportunity for both zone committees to, to kick the science and kick the economics. Um, we also have our chair, Arapata, who is also on the Waimakariri Zone Committee, is the Ngātua Hariri representative. Um, in terms of uh, what the options are, that's still very much in discussion um, around how do we deal with um, this particular issue. Uh, the technical work that has been going on since you last received a briefing was on those test wells and also identifying, um, kind of delineating where the actual source area was going to be. So that next step is about now that we know this particular area and the issues, what are the options, what are we going to do about it. So that's that's the conversation that you'll be getting a briefing, I understand, with councillor to councillor conversations tomorrow as well. And I guess the, the further question there is, you know, uh, how much can the zone committees do about this? We can only recommend to the, uh, the regional council to perhaps Mm. Yes, I think it would be useful for just a quick explanation because I think, you know, although this has obviously been in the public arena um, for for some time, uh, you know, we don't want people to to, to misunderstand what the, the 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 roles and responsibilities are. So perhaps if you just speak to the the, the role of the the regional council, we can, and um, and then how the uh, community uh, sorry the zone committee feeds into that process. So the role of the Environment Canterbury is a regulator. So at the moment it is developing its provisions for the Waimakariri zone that actually uh, will set the direction of travel for those landowners in terms of what they can discharge. So it'll be setting the nitrate limits. The role of the two zone committees, Waimakariri and Christchurch West Melton, have a role in talking to the communities and providing some recommendations. So they set the kind of direction of travel and, and they'll also be setting some recommendations about time frames. So how quickly can we actually move to, to um, move landowners to reducing their nitrates um, coming in? So that's, and that's where the discussions are at the moment. 
between both of the zone committees um, and, and also um, Environment Canterbury away from those three communities. Now, obviously, um, we're talking about a, an area of land that's not in our catchment, mm -hmm. uh, but the impact potentially, mm -hmm. if it's there, is on our catchment in terms of the um, deep aquifers. So, um, in in determine in making a determination in that regard, how much weight is given to the impact on the the neighbouring? I mean, I know that the ECAN looks at a region, but look, people are not going to understand the the fact that one's on one side of the boundary in terms of land use that's allowed under a district plan that we have no say over, um, a, as compared to our side where we do. Um, well, not entirely, but have some say over. <laughs> we used to. <laughs> Once, in the olden days. Absolutely. Um, and that will obviously be the final decisions will be um, with Environment Canterbury. And that's what they want to talk to, start talking to you about, as I understand it, governance level tomorrow. Um, Thank you very much for your report and all the work the Ozone Committee do. Um, you referred, um, Lance, I think you referred to the plantings on Worsley Spur too, and that's a great example of the work that your committee support and do. Um, what I wanted to ask you about in relation to Worsley Spur was the, the whole issue of runoff um, and, and soil runoff that you've referred to. I, I've just got some concern that the developments that are current, the residential developments that are currently progressing, and, and will have mitigation required. I'm just wondering, in your view, if there is sufficient mitigation around those um, recent developments on Worsley Spur, in your view? I don't know all the specifics, um, but when we did do the, uh, when they approached us regarding putting in funding to the, to the project, um, there is, down at the base of Worsley Spur, which then feeds into the Cashmere Stream, um, <coughs> there is a tributary that there that my understanding is part of the subdivision and the work that's going on that flat area there. Yep. Um, they are going to uh, recontour that what used to be a stream. Uh, it's going to have plantings. I understand in future um, division, uh, sorry, development, they're also going to make the track go up the side in the gully there, um, and that they're going to make sure that there is sediment controls in, a, in, in the natural way to stop a lot of that stuff coming okay. down. Good. So I know that it's been discussed, I just don't know the specifics. Yeah. Okay, thanks Lance. I'm so Vicky. Um, just in terms of the Waimakariri Wells project, because the, the report was excellent, but this paragraph just jumped out at me. Um, and I agree with you completely that we thought this was a rabbit proof fence, but it's not a nitrate proof fence, it, it seems. And obviously the deep aquifers are one of our um, three pillars upon which we rest our secure drinking water status and we never want to face an issue <laughs> with them. Uh, so I'm just, uh, you, you talked about, you knew now, know now the source area um, of the contamination? Uh, that is my understanding, is uh, right. they've been able to delineate that. Right, and we know the nitrates are coming under the WIMAC. Mm -hmm. Just um, how quickly could ECAN act on this uh, in terms of the powers that they have? They, they will be able to act on it through the, the planning process. So um, we are expecting to have an operative plan. My understanding will be late or notified um, next year. Mm. So, and then how long that becomes operative, as you understand, um, planning processes do take some time. So is there no other power that ECAN has or the drinking water assessor has that could mitigate this way more quickly than that process? Could it be, could it be referred up to the, what, what's the process under the RMA that, that brings, it, brings it to, um, what is it, the EPA, is it? There, there is a process at the moment um, called uh, Plan Change 5 that's already quite a long way through the planning process, it's under appeal at the moment. That brings in good management practice across the region. So that is actually already driving some of the land use change that needs to happen. And it's also driving 
uh, some of the farmers um, to apply to Environment Canterbury for consents to farm and also farm environment plans. So some of those landowners will be caught by that. Is there any possibility of any faster action under something like, I don't know, Regeneration Act or the Environmental Protection Agency? Um, I can't answer that specifically, but I'll get some advice so you can discuss that tomorrow mm -hmm. with the councillors. Do you mean farm management plans? Farm environment plans. Farm environment plans, and there's about 3,000 now across the region, so there will be some of my macroery that have them as well. That's great. Look, thank you very much. And um, I mean, for a very detailed report, it's um, excellent. Thank you. Um, the last one is the um, Banks Peninsula Zone Committee. Tēnā koutou katoa. And happy birthday, Your Worship. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so uh, this is our annual report. It's so long ago I, I, I've lost interest in it, so I'm, unless you've got <laughs> questions, I'll, um, I'll skip, skip straight on to what's been going on with the Zone Committee in the last two or three months. Um, the hot topic since the um, Waiiki debris flow at Teddington has been the future of forestry on Banks Peninsula, and, and at all our last two or three meetings we've discussed that in one form or another. Um, and at the last meeting, um, we had a briefing about the new uh, national um, environmental standard for plantation forestry, NESPL, um, and, uh, which it turns out is quite a permissive document, and we're a bit concerned that Banks Peninsula is zoned green. That means that uh, forestry activities do not, that's a permitted, act forestry is a permitted activity on Banks Peninsula. So um, we've been trying to catch up with what the existing rules are in the district plan and in the regional plan. Um, and, and what we're, um, what we're um, I think the feeling of the zone committee is that um, that assessment of being a green and, and a yellow zone are probably um, not quite right. That may be, uh, um, so we'd, we'd like to understand better how that was reached. We, uh, we understand it's based on topography and rock, but I'm not sure how much the soils, the, the effect of the soils was, and this would be an, a, an, um, an issue in both these other zones too, who um, have the same lowest soil type, which is very frangible. Um, so what we are asking is um, that the planners from Christchurch City Council and the planners from Environment Canterbury work closely on um, amendments to our various statutory instruments to ensure that the revision of the planning rules for forestry is fit for purpose for Banks Peninsula and will ensure um, that water quality will be maintained and enhanced. Just, I've just um, put this up here, but um, <clears throat> I was going to suggest something else, but we can't. <coughs> Excuse me. So just note, um, I was actually going to, you know, sort of a, agree that council's planning staff work closely. <coughs> Excuse me, with Environment Canterbury's planning staff to amend plans if necessary to ensure alignment of plantage, plantation forestry rules for Banks Peninsula with the National Environment sta Statement for Plantation Forestry, which came to effect on 1 May 2018. So that's what we'd like. Just, just, yep. an, just a noting provision. Yes. Yeah. Just highlighting the issue. Yeah. And um, yeah, just. Well, we could just, we could simply take out note the banks punch zone and just put request that the council's planning staff work closely with environment. I like that. Yes. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> they I think did that's, agree that, to that, it that, on the night, um, so we're just and actually it. in a very significant event. A card was passed from a planning staff member to another planning staff member. Right. <laughs> <laughs> From ac across across council boundaries yes, between the two councils. Wow, yeah. <laughs> that's fantastic news. <laughs> no, sorry, somebody had their hand up, uh, Yanni. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Just in terms of previously, you've raised concern with stock being able to be on council land accessing the waterways. That's right. Yes. Is there any update on that? Um, not that I'm aware of. I know that staff have been working on it because someone contacted me recently, oh, you know, a couple of months ago to say who was working on it. 
asked me who it was, and I referred them to Paul Devlin, but um, I don't know, haven't heard anything since. I don't know quite how we're tracking that. I think we've had a formal resolution previously. It might be quite good just to, mm. I don't know, so note what, in the reports. So or, what, 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 is, what is the issue? Um, the issue is that on a whole bunch of our land, well, I don't, I don't know how much, but in certain places where we lease land to farmers, we don't have effective stock control, so the stock are able to end up in the waterways. Yeah, but what's the, what's the real. issue that we're asking staff to report back on? Um, well, what progress is made on that issue? It's particularly an issue in Akuti Valley where there's a community group that's working to improve water quality there and they see the stock on the Esplanade Reserve, there's no fence between the private land and the council's Esplanade Reserve and it, they're getting into the creek. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. But there are other places. I'd like some words, so if somebody could just write some words down, that would be great. Andrew? Um, yeah, so just, just on that one, I mean, it might just be as simple as requesting an update from staff on what progress has been made on the masses raised regarding stock um, having the ability to enter the waterway at Akuti Valley. Okay. Well, actually, it's more than Akuti Valley. There are a number of these Esplanade Reserves over Max and yeah. um, I suspect it's happening in other yeah. places too. So maybe we just take out the words at Akuti Valley. I mean, yeah, Akuti's regarding the stock. example, and I'm aware that Paul Devlin was doing some work on that, and I'm just as keen as Yanni and probably just as keen as the Zone Committee to know where that has progressed yeah, okay. to. But could, could we just do it through the next Chief Executive's report? Is that okay? So, request um, update from staff regarding stock entering what? Waterways. Waterways. From council owned land. From council owned land. Is it only happening on Banks Peninsula? Um, the, oh, look, do, 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 I, I know that this was a, raised, this uh, an issue that was raised by the um, Banks Peninsula Zone Committee. That's right. All right. And then um, at the next um, in the next uh, uh, CE report. Well, no, it's, it's been raised in public. We might as well report it in public. It's just easier that way. Andrew, um, Paula, hi. Thanks for the um, report. Um, the the section of the zone committee report reducing sediment from roads. Um, and I mean, this is something that, again, has been talked about for a, a long time. Um, mm. The trial which is um, described in the Zone Committee report, to what extent is that joined up with um, priority actions 1.2 and 1.3 in the Faka Aura Whole of Harbour Catchment Management Plan? Because I notice in particular that um, Priority Action 1.3 in the Catchment Management Plan um, is um, implementing, support, promote and implement the learnings from an erosion and sediment control pilot pl project on Littleton Harbour Basin roadside cuttings. So uh, I would hope that this is, is joined up because it looks like two very similar work streams and if it's not then we may, need to make sure it is, I think. I think that reference in the Whakaura uh, Fogger Aura plan is actually a reference to the, that project, that particular project. So it's the, the roadside same project. cutting project that um, the ECAN staff are uh, uh, coordinating. Excellent. Yes. And the learnings from that will help inform anybody dealing with lower soils on roadside cuttings, hopefully. But I mean, that's only a tiny fraction of the sediment source. And oh, as absolutely. I drove in today, every one of our hundreds of streams on Banks Peninsula is flowing brown, as are the ones on the on the Kashmir side and, and round coming off all these lower soils. Yeah, and, and of course you look at the Tons of sediment harbour. is pouring into the harbours and long bays. Yeah, you look speak. at the harbour on a day like today and you I can know. see where all of those streams <laughs> empty into the harbour by the whole brown murk that's out there. But anyway, that was one place where we w was highly visible that we thought we could make a start and um, hopefully when this project finally um, happens, it seems to be taking a long time, um, we might learn something that we can use. Yeah. Kia ora. Well, look, thank you very much. Um, and would someone like to move that we receive the information that we request the second one and request the third one as well? So, Andrew, seconded by Phil. I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Right, and now the um, last item on, on this part of the agenda. Uh, the hearings panel report to the Council on the Draft Takapuniki Reserve Management Plan and I'd like to um, 
and Vait Mel uh, Tainui, uh, Deputy Chair of Onuku Runanga, um, to join us at the table, oh, and Rick, Rick Tainui as well. Welcome, both of you. Um, kia ora. And um, I'd like to now just hand over to uh, the Chair of the Hearings Panel, um, Andrew Turner, to introduce this item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I'm very pleased to have had the privilege to, to chair this hearings panel. Um, made up of myself, Councillor David East and Councillor Yanni Johansson. Um, and at this point I'd like to thank the members of the hearings panel for their high level of engagement and involvement. Um, this particular hearings panel required a reasonable level of participation. There were three meetings um, and a site visit to the reserve um, as well. So thank you very much indeed to, to the two of you for your involvement. Um, and I'd also like to um, acknowledge um, Onuku Runanga Chair Rick Tainui, Deputy Chair Mel Tainui, um, and Community Board Chair Pam Richardson, um, <clears throat> and other members of the Onuku Runanga who are um, here with us today. <coughs> Excuse me. It's also important that we acknowledge the work which has got us to this point um, of having a plan in front of us for adoption. Um, the work's involved many participants over many, many years, um, and I'd like to particularly acknowledge the work done over the last two years um, developing the plan by the project team. Um, that project team, apart from doing a huge amount of work um, in the development of the plan and including writing the draft, um, has been a perfect manifestation of partnership. Um, equal representation from the Onuku Runanga and from the City Council and one representative from the Community Board. And Section 4 of our report today um, really tells the story of the development of the plan and the steps that have um, taken place as we've moved towards the point we're at today um, and the partnership which has really been a cornerstone of the development of the plan and is a, a true expression of the Te Honunga relationship. So to speak to the specific recommendations from the hearings panel, um, recommendation one, formally adopting the plan, um, is actually more significant than it might first appear. Um, this will be the first plan that we've adopted, which has been developed in true partnership with Runanga, and which contains specific Manafenua values. The, um, the report and its achievement really is something to celebrate, um, both for Onuku Runanga and for the City Council. Recommendation two, um, requesting that a formal application be made for National Reserves Act status. Um, this is obviously a process that needs to be followed, but if successful, this will give the Takapunika Reserve the same status as the Waitangi Treaty Grounds, which will recognise its major cultural and national significance. Recommendation three, establishing the co-governance group, um, looks to governance of the reserve in the immediate future until the reserve is declared a national reserve. This continues to give effect to the partnership between Runanga and Council and again gives effect to the Te Honunga relationship through the relationship particularly between the local Runanga and the local community board. Recommendation four relates to the immediate work that the co-governance group will turn its mind to once it's been formed. Recommendation five, thanking all of those involved for the participation in the process, acknowledging that many of these people have involved for many years. The level of interest by the local community in this reserve was evident both in the huge level of involvement in the public engagement and consultation process, the number of submitters, first of all submitting but then wanting to be heard, the quality of the submissions and the number of community members attending the meetings of the hearings panel and certainly that last meeting in Akaroa was well attended both by members of the wider Banks Peninsula community um, and well attended by um, representatives of local Runanga as well and that was really good to see. Matters that the hearings panel had particular regard to as a result of submissions were traffic effects, car parking, um, finding the balance between commercialization of parts of the reserve with community expectation whilst at the same time still allowing for establishment of facilities such as um, visitor centre, visitor facilities, interpretation, um, education centre, guided walks and other educational opportunities, all of which could, a could assist in the aspirations of local Runanga, providing employment opportunities or possibly social enterprise opportunities. So this really is an important step in what's been quite a long journey. Um, going back to at least 2008, quite possibly before that, when the classification of the land was changed to historic <coughs> reserve status with strong public support at that time for the change. 
um, and thanks to my colleague Yanni Johansson um, for providing us, and I think it's been circulated to all councillors just this morning, with the details of the meeting where that matter was considered. Um, chaired by former Banks Peninsula Deputy Mayor and then Akaro Wairua Community Board Chair um, Stuart Miller. And this shows that consideration of these matters has been ongoing for some time, have involved a large number of participants, not all of whom are still involved, but many of whom will still retain a very strong interest in the adoption of the um, plan that we're looking at today. It's important that the contribution of everybody who's been part of the journey to this point is acknowledged. It's a journey of meaningful partnership, and today we've got an opportunity to acknowledge the importance of this special reserve and its extremely important cultural significance. It's also important that we take the opportunity today to celebrate the collaborative way that we've worked together in a true partnership to reach the point of having the plan in front of us today for adoption. And finally, in another manifestation of the way that the partnership is very much alive and well, and very genuine, one of the conversations which has occurred between the final meeting of the hearings panel and today's, uh, today's adoption meeting has been around the value and the appropriateness of Mano Fenua representation on the hearings panel. And at this point I'd note that Christine Wilson was originally to be appointed to the panel and would have given effect to this type of representation, but unfortunately was unable to participate due to sickness. When she was replaced, the particular attributes that Christine would have brought to the panel in this regard um, were not explicitly taken into account. This has given rise to what really has been a good quality conversation between council staff and Anoka Runanga since the, first, um, since the final meeting of the hearings panel. And as a result of those conversations, I've got an additional recommendation that I'd like to add, um, the wording of which I think has already been provided. Um, so we got the wording. Yeah, number six. Item 6, request a report to the Council meeting on the 5th of July on how Council can ensure it has appropriate Runanga representation on hearings panels where matters of significance to Manafenua are being heard. So it's good that the conversation that's been able to occur since the final meeting of the hearings panel um, has given rise to a resolution that will inform other good processes in future and that we've been able to take this example to give effect to the concerns or what originally were concerns from Runanga which we're, we're now able to take on board in this way. So thank you for the opportunity to do that. Kia ora. Kia ora and thank you very much for that and um, now I'd like to um, invite uh, you Mel if, if you would like to make a presentation um, on behalf of the Runanga. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> He te puaki aui te takiwā o te pāta ko rākau hautu, uh, ko onaku utaku te rakau mai mai. Uh, he tino, he tino tata te, te hāpore me te whenua me te whānau ki taku ngā koe. Um, so tēnei te mehi. Yep. So my name is Mel. I sit <laughs> in the taha o, 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 o taku rangatera, um, my, my uncle Rick, with my whānau um, um, right behind me. So... I just wanted to really take the opportunity to 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 and share with you a piece around Takapuniki um, alongside the, these amazing people that I've been working with in the last two years, and and I, I really want to be able to thank the, the likes of Brent, um, Pam, and Russell, um, Uncle Petty, and and Deb who have worked so hard on this management plan, and and Russell for your uh, patience and, and loving attendance to us. Um, I wanted to share with you really around Takapuniki uh, a, um, a piece of, of our whenua. Now I've grown up as a, um, a very privileged young Māori girl on my whenua and um, I've known nothing more than pride of place. You know, my father was, so he really adored his environment and he, he knew every rock, he knew every hill, he knew every cow in his earlier, in his earlier life. And, and he taught this to us through the strength of my toa. 
my toll was a very important part of our whānau and, um, and she was definitely the, the, the mentor. But she, she grew in a time of grievance. She lived her entire life of grievance. Um, so you never really know grievance until you, uh, a grievance of whenua, whānau, identity, until you have travelled in a car from Akuroa to Onaku, which we called the kike then, until you've travelled with my toa. We would always have, pay tribute to Takapuniki, we always had to. You always had a moment of silence. And we never, we never asked her, and she never told us. But you definitely knew with that tear rolling down her eye that Takapuniki was meaningful. And so we, we never talked about this. She never talked about the blood of our ancestors that had been shed on Takapuniki. She never talked about our tupuna, whenua. But she would mention three words. No, she often uttered three words to us, which was mātewa, mātewa. You know, and mātewa has told us that the whenua would tell us in time when it was ready to, to heal the mamai, the, 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 the sadness, the hurt. You know, mātewa told us that we would know when it was time, and that was not the time. Because the hurt was really strong within my toa. And toa is a grandparent, if you, if you didn't know the word. But it was very strong within her. So now is that time. We know that Matewa has come to fruition and that we are able to, to heal that mamai. Um, it, it is, I relate it to very much a, someone being in a really critical condition of, of treatment and now you've, that they're in that, that road of recovery. That is what is happening with Takapuniki. Takapuniki is in a time of, of real healing. Um, in 2000, and I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned it today. So in, in 2000, I, I, I um, shipped my family up to Wellington to where I worked on the Wahi Tapu registration of Takapuniki at Historic Places Trust is where we worked on that. And I'm mihi in this moment to Bill Tramposh and the Kinahi Teira for their support and their guidance for me to be able to complete this Wahi Tapu registration at that time. And it was two and a half years of, of great work, but there I got to learn a lot about who I was. This was the greatest influence of research I had ever been involved in. So I got to learn a, a lot about who I was, but I also was really confronted with some of the, the, um, the levels of, um, of torment that, that Takapuni had gone through, such as the rubbish dump and the sewage. It was very confronting, very confronting to us. But, um, but besides from that, it took us on an, on, a, on an amazing journey to get us to where we are today. So this is where we are today, and Matewa is, is right here. And I'm, um, you know, I feel honoured. I do feel honoured that my that my fucker papa takes me back to to such a place as Takapuniki, and I can feel the, um, the the future on the horizon. You know, the demands of us to survive in the past, and not the demands of us to al allow us to thrive today. And the connection that I have to Takapuniki is nothing compared to the connection that our next generation, one that I brought with me, um, that, that they all have to this whenua, because they don't have the same grievances as we have. You know, that, that, that they have connection to, to the whenua, but also to their own identity. So um, they are stronger, they are wiser, and they are more equipped to take on the future. Um, I've really brought, up, brought with me a... Um, and thanks to the whānau behind me, uh, a, a kōruai, to, to, um, to signify this partnership that has happened over this management plan. This, this has been a real partnership that has been a treaty promise. You know, this is a promise of the treaty that we have really played out. There has been no word discussed about us without us, you know, and that is so important. So I really want to entrust this amazing management plan over to you, and um, with your, with the trust of your commitment to the to the Rinanga and to the mana whenua, that um, you understand the, the the significance of this beautiful place of Takapuniki, not only to us as mana whenua, to us as a greater nation, and that you um, you really honour the um, the greater purpose of our future. Uh, so tēnā te mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, uh, tēnā ra koutou, tēnā ra koutou, tēnā ra koutou katoa. Ia yeah, koutou. Um. Oh, you, are we going to? Yeah. Are we going to? Yeah. Okay. Are we going to? Okay. 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 Okay.
Look, I, I just want to um, just say a couple of words, um, and that uh, was an incredibly, incredibly powerful uh, presentation. Um, I, uh, I, I, I have felt really moved by the expression um, of Araha and the strength that has been brought to the table by the um, partnership that this represents. And uh, a, a korowai um, is a perfect way to offer uh, protection against the elements, um, protection against uh, those things that have occurred in the past, and also uh, protection as we go forward um, into a new future um, together. So um, it really does represent something pretty special. So thank you very much on behalf of the City of Christchurch and Banks Peninsula, because we represent the peninsula um, as well. And um, it really has been an honour and a privilege to have you at the table um, as we consider uh, adopting this resolution. So I will stop speaking and um, sit down, because we have a technical process now to go through. So um, um, obviously, Andrew, you'd like to move the resolution and uh, 
who would like to second the resolution, I'd take Yanni Johansson. Um, now, is there any debate on it? Yanni, yes, please. Thank you. Um, well, I have to say, as a newly elected councillor in 2008, I was privileged to be asked to go to a hearing panel uh, over on the peninsula in the old Gaiety before it had been repaired. And it was probably well, before it had been earthquake damaged. Yeah, earthquake <laughs> damaged, and, and um, it was probably one of the most uh, underestimated moments of my short political career because when I arrived at the Gaiety and saw the submission, the submitters uh, in regards to Takapaniki, the request was that we turn it into a historic reserve, uh, and it was really overwhelming to see the significance of that site and to really comprehend how important it was. And that was the start of my journey with Takapaniki. Um, I just wanted to just quickly, very quickly reflect on that and just acknowledge two, two people in particular, although there have been many more people involved for a huge number of years on this. But from that hearing in 2008, um, which led to the development of a conservation report, which we've got, and now today the management plan, um, I just want to acknowledge George Tikau, who really started the, the submissions on that day, and the strength and the passion with which he impressed upon us the importance of this site. So I really wanted to acknowledge George. And one thing that um, he put in his submission, which um, was referenced to historian Harry Everson, and uh, I just thought it was important to acknowledge Unfortunately, um, back then, he, he couldn't at attend the hearing, but he had written a pretty powerful letter to us as a hearings panel. And um, George basically said, what Harry has written, we agree with. So, I mean, that, that was really nice. And, you know, um, in, in concluding that hearing on that day, when we were summing up, one of the other comments that um, George Tikal made, which um, obviously this was before the earthquake, he pointed out that it had taken a long time to get to this point and that another 10 or 12 years or 20 years was not the issue. As long as it happens, but the sooner the better. And obviously it's 10 years on from uh, that, that first hearing panel, uh, but obviously we've had the earthquake and a lot of pressure on our resources. But I think the, the significant things that have happened since then are the work that's been done around the Akarawa wastewater treatment. That was certainly a really important uh, point that we are addressing as a council, was the formulation of the conservation report uh, and was also uh, the development of the management plan which we're, we're concluding today. Of course there's still more work to be done and that is approaching central government over the classification of the um, national reserve status and you know I, I, I'm not quite sure what that process is um, but it is important that we do support that process with, with the appropriate level of resourcing. Uh, so I just wanted to just very quickly in conclusion just read from the actual um, the hearing panel proposal from that day because I think the words actually sum up quite nicely um, the, the reflection of coming together uh, to support what is a really important piece of land and, and part of uh, this. It's a really important story actually. It's not the piece of land, it's also the story that goes with it that is incredibly important. And um, so, and again, I know my former colleague, um, well, my, my co council colleague is a knowledge former, former councillor, Claudia Reid, and also Stuart Miller, who are on that hearing panel. But those presenting submissions to the panel unanimously supported it. The submitters urged the council to pursue the case for the land to become a national historic reserve, and in due course, move the Akara wastewater treatment works away from Takapaniki. The Akara Wairua Community Board minutes um, recorded that the hearing panel noted the immense significance of the issues raised um, by submitters and further reflected that the occasion of the hearing had been one of great dignity backed by a highly committed community who brought forward the results of work by many people over many years. Um, and I just think you know, it's really important to acknowledge that this has been an incredibly long, painful journey, but that we're making progress uh, and we acknowledge all those people far too many to name in person today who have contributed um, and we move forward. So I'm really proud to stand here and move this forward today. <coughs> I do too want to acknowledge all the people that have been involved 
um, without naming all the, of them specifically, um, and just to really look forward to that next stage. One of the really important things in the hearing panel recommendation today though, just to um, sum up, is that we're, we're setting up a co-governance group. The hearings panel I think deliberated around the acknowledgement that resources need to go into ensuring that the things we say we're going to do in the management plan can happen. So it's really important that we do identify those priorities and have a process by which those things can progress. I'm really optimistic it's not going to take another 10 years to get further progress, um, but as has been said, you know, it's better that it happens sooner rather than later, and I think this is a real good step along that journey. So thank you to everyone that's been involved. Dion. I just wanted to quickly um, acknowledge your words, actually. They were incredibly grounding, and um, I think it's a good time to remember our history of New Zealand, where we have come from and where we've come from together. There's a lot of things and a lot of hurt in our country that still needs to be resolved and these things that we're going through right now are actually those things that are going to resolve that so that the next generation can actually truly work together and actually be that multi or that bicultural country that embraces a multicultural future because I actually believe that is how we will probably be the best little country in the world. Um, your, your words really really did touch me because a year ago Actually, a year ago in two days, I was up at home um, at Parihaka, where we went through a similar process with the Crown Apology, and we're going through the uh, Reconciliation Act at government at the moment. And I do remember the stories of my elders telling us about what happened at home. And I know there's a lot of connection with, with Banks Peninsula and our, um, our whakapapa as well. And it was really moving really moving um, and I think we all as New Zealanders need to know where we've come from. It is something that I find a disgrace that you ask people about what happened in New Zealand only 150 years ago. And nobody really knows and I think this is a great step for locally to actually start telling the stories but not telling it in a way to start opening up the hurt but actually to really heal and actually to go, we've moved on so much from then and we are actually moving on together. And so I thank you for your story and I really encourage more of us to start telling those and actually looking at the positive side to where we can go. So thank you. Kia ora, thank you, Dion. Andrew, would you like to close? Thank you. I think um, this morning has been a, a particularly poignant moment. I'd, I referred to the journey of the, the development of the plan earlier and there are different people that have been part of that journey at its various different stages. But I, I love the fact and, and really want to just sort of take a moment to, to stop and um, you know, really, really acknowledge the fact that we've taken this opportunity today to, um, to acknowledge the past. Um, to be thankful for the people that have been involved in um, developing the plan to bring it to this point um, and to celebrate the, the partnership and the strength of relationships which has brought us to the point that we're at today where we've got a, um, a development plan that we're able to, um, a management plan that we're able to adopt. Um, but really I think um, from all of the comments that have been made today, um, show confidence and been able to look forward with confidence to the future and the delivery of all of the aspirations in this plan. So that as, be, as has been said, we know that the future for our children um, not only rights some of the wrongs of the past, but is something that we can all look forward to. And I really just want to acknowledge um, all of the words that have been said this morning and, and um, clearly the, the passion and the involvement of, of all of the people that have got us to the point that we're at today. And it, it gives me a, a huge amount of pleasure um, to be able to move what really is a significant and, and, few, and hugely important um, resolution this morning, to put it in our council terms, but a significant and important point on the journey that recognises the, the cultural significance of this very important piece of land. Thank you. So the um, motion has been moved and seconded, and I'll put the motion. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no.
That's Carrie. Thank you very much. Kia ora. <laughs> Um, I'd like to um, move the uh, resolution uh, in front of us and that uh, Steve Clark remain for the um, first of the PX items. Um, uh, do I have a seconder for that? Mike Davidson, I'll put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Those opposed say no. That is carried.